in accordance with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 71, Section 38N, the hearing is now open for members of the public to discuss the proposed FY 2018 School Committee's recommended Brockton Public Schools budget. Um, like the hearing of visitors in our regular school committee meeting, the role of the school committee is to listen to comments and concerns. Uh, members of the committee will not respond to statements or questions during the course of the hearing uh, in consideration. We will take that information under advisement. In consideration, uh, we ask that all speakers um, limit their remarks to a maximum of three minutes. Um, after the last person has Thank you. After the per last person has um, presented their information, we will then close the public hearing. So I have uh, three people that have signed up. The first person I'd like to welcome is Julie Fairfield. Julie, hi there. Hi. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to stand. I'm a teacher, so I get nervous sitting. Um, my name is Julie Fairfield. I'm sure the microphone is going to be too this on. Oh, the microphone? I talk pretty loudly. Um, it's not going to be loud. Okay. okay. Does that come off? You can take it right off. Yeah, take it off. Okay, now I have to know how to turn it off. So you've got to be smarter than the microphone. Sorry, you. Hello? Hello? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Okay. What I want to say is um, a couple of years ago, my husband and I decided to move up here from Texas. And um, as I am wont to do, I researched because I wanted to teach. Um, I taught for 11 years in Texas. I wanted to teach at a high school here. And I, um, I thought I would just find like websites on schools and go and see, you know, but I found um, all of this information about Brockton High School in national media, um, magazines, New York Times articles talking about the turnaround in Brockton High School and how amazing it was and it, it was just there were so many articles and it was they were talking about how large it was 4700 kids and I come from a school we have districts we had seven high schools in our district our school had 2700 kids so I like large schools I like lots of kids and so I was like, this is where I'm going. This is the place for me. So when I moved up here, I, I studied. I had to take all of those tests again. And within eight months, I had my license. And um, this is, I'm finishing up my second year teaching math here at Brockton High School. And I, I absolutely love it here. Um, I absolutely feel that I belong here. So it's devastating when you're told that you know, you, you may not be back. My biggest fear is, I don't know, maybe five years from now, there's going to be a teacher, somebody in Texas or somewhere else that wants to move up to this area and they're going to they're gonna do a search of schools. They are going to see where they want to go to work, where they want, whose kids are they going to be passionate about and help and love and take care of. and. They're not going to read all this wonderful stuff about Brockton and Brockton High School because it, when you have a class full of, of Algebra 1 students who can barely add, subtract, multiply, and divide with a calculator, um, you know, and, and you're pushing them along and you're showing them, a, maybe not a love for math because I'm usually the only one in the room that loves math, but at least, you know, that they can do it. They can get there. When you have 30 freshmen that are very, very low, it's, it's, it makes it exponentially more difficult. The, the smaller the classes when they're that low a level, you can reach them. You can get those kids and you can get them involved. And I, I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm just, I'm asking you to do it. I'm asking you, don't make my kids be in a classroom with 30 kids that are really low level and and just and they'll be throwaway. They won't make it because they'll everybody will be focused on the ones who are making the A's or the ones who are doing it. Not that kid in the back of the room who is saying, I'm not even gonna try. I want to get that kid in the back of the room. And I'm asking you to find a way to make this happen. Find a way to make this 
this high school stay the great high school that it is. Thank you. Um, you may or may not know I have been sharing my love with the City Council. I'm thoroughly aware that the City Council and the Mayor, who once again is not here, has um, given you a horrendous budget. I am thoroughly aware of that and I assure you in my own circles we are working on that as well. I just want to remind you a little bit about what your job is though. Your job is to advocate for the school budget. It should have been done for months before. Your job is also to make sure that the budget is not determined behind closed doors this summer because the fact that there's so few people here, I couldn't find a budget posted online. Perhaps it was. Was it posted online? Because I looked on the school committee website. I didn't see it there. And in fact, under FY18 budgets, it, it wasn't there. So if you want to have honest public comment, you need to follow the law. You're correct. We need to have, a, yes, the law says seven days. Now doesn't help me because you know when I needed it? I needed it this week when I've been organizing parents and fellow teachers that live in Brockton. This is when I needed this, so this is helpful. But I certainly hope this is not the only budget hearing because the whole purpose of public comment is to engage the public. In the past three years, that has not been done very well. And it's one of the reasons why the mayor has gotten away with the budget that he's presented you. And it's one of the reasons why, when we all come back to school, the, 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 the budget is not necessarily what people would have expected, what was promised for cuts back in the spring. Had the public been included, through these steps, which is the purpose of this hearing, is to include and educate. That's your job, too. Your job is to educate your constituents on the budget. You want to get people engaged. And I, if that's not happening, that's a problem, and that's on you. It's also on me. You know, I, I, I'm going to point fingers. I'm blaming the mayor for the horrible budget that he created. I'm blaming the city council for letting it happen. And But th there's, there's, there's blame here as well, with you and with me. Because now I'm getting engaged, and now I see what I need to do, and I'm having trouble finding the information that I need. And that needs to happen. So I certainly hope that there is another hearing once this is out and thoroughly understood and thoroughly discussed. That's what you want to do. I will say as a final note, I know I'm coming down hard on a lot of people, and I've done this the last few weeks. I've made a lot of enemies the last six weeks. I understand that many of you have kids in the system with my kids. You have skin in this game too. I'm aware of that. But I need more fight. I need more fight from my school committee. You're the ones that have to stand up to the city council. I was happy to see some of you at the, 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 the budget meeting that Friday. But I was disgusted that the city council asked Kathleen Smith, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? That's on you too to help the city council know to fight. We need to be fighting. I feel like I'm the only one fighting sometimes. Oh, there's my three minutes. I'll stop. <laughs> Sorry. How are you? Good evening, everyone. Um, I think most of you know me. I'm Kim Gibson, president of the Brockton Education Association. I have not spoken to you at this point in the budget um, because I was, I've been watching everything play out. I have to tell you the number of phone calls I received today and emails regarding um, exactly what Faith Tabon has said about the public hearing was that people didn't know about it. So I have some questions procedurally for you. When was the notice of the public hearing posted? Where was the notice posted? Is there a copy of the notice? Is the proposed annual budget available to the public? Where exactly is it located? will there be a second hearing for the public to come and actually vet some of these decisions? I know you still have some decisions to make over the summer, and that's one of the concerns of not only the teachers, but the other unions as well. Some of them are not here tonight. I did speak with a few of them. As the school committee um, is aware, there is a tremendous anxiety amongst the community, the teachers, the paraprofessionals, custodians, administrative assistants, even the students. The students are disheartened as well. I hear from some of them. We understand that you have been given this $16 million deficit that you have to deal with. 
But one of the issues that I'm dealing with as BEA president are the number of calls and emails I continue to receive about the specific positions that are being cut. And that is a policy. The budget is a policy. So the school committee should be saying which positions are eliminated. And I don't have answers for them. I, we, I know you're making your decisions, but I can't say to them, oh, I know you've lost four ESL teachers. Those positions are lost. That's one of the frustrations on the teacher's side, and it continues to get exasperated meeting after meeting, and you are voting on which positions to bring back this evening. So one of my questions is, do you have the list of positions this evening that you're voting back, or are you just voting back a number of positions? Again, it's your responsibility. This is policy. The budget is policy. So the teachers are looking to me to say, these are the positions that are coming back, and I can't do that at this point. Um, I know you have a very daunting task ahead of you. I'm assuming there will be another hearing over the summer because there are, like I said, there's some people who don't understand where to find the budget. I looked on the BPS website and the budget barometer is there, but the book is not there. So that's why I'm asking you, where is the budget book? Where is that kept for the public to know where to go to look for that? Because their question is, how many teachers will be in my school? And some of the teachers are residents, and those are the ones calling me saying, I don't know what my child's school looks like next year. And they're afraid to come before you because they are employees. I had a few people who said they would come to speak tonight. They're, they're like, I really don't want a target on my back, which is, is disheartening to me because I want the teachers here advocating for themselves. So I do ask those questions of you. They, there are people in the buildings who just don't know what their own children's classrooms will look like next year. So I want to thank you for your work ahead of you, but I do want to make you aware of those concerns from the BEA and especially from the members who live in the city. Okay, um, those were the only people that signed up. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, we will close the public <coughs> hearing with a bang. Okay, um, so um, motion to close public hearing. Oh, there's some. Did I miss them? Oh, hello. Did you want to sign up? Okay. What's your name, ma'am? I'll put your name in. My name is um, Mrs. Kajun. Can you just spell your first name? K-E-T-H-L-Y-N. K-E-T-H-L-Y-N. Kajust. C-A-J-U-S-T-E? Yeah. Okay. And your address, ma'am? Your address? My address, 19 Greer Circle. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm fairly new to the district. Um, I came here three years ago. And I remember when I came to the orientation meeting, I met um, Superintendent Smith and I met Mr. Tarasi, and I was taken aback by how long people had been working in the district how much time they had invested in the district. Um, and that impressed me because I was coming from Boston Public Schools, a district which is in shambles right now. I have invested over 20 years as an educator in Massachusetts. And when I came to Brockton, not only did I come in um, and was taken aback because of all the rumors, come on everyone, we've all heard of um, Brockton, and we heard certain things that weren't very nice about what was being said about Brockton. So when I came to Brockton Public Schools, I was very shocked, and I was impressed, and I was pleasantly surprised. P so pleasantly surprised that I decided to move to Brockton. I am a Brockton resident now, and my son is of high school age, and he's ready to, go, to come to Brockton High. And as a parent, I am very afraid of what he is going to find. A lot of people are afraid to send their kids to Brockton High now and are looking at other alternatives because of all of these budget cuts. Parents who have kids who speak different language, this year, I, for the years that I've been at Brockton, I've been working at the Haitian, as the Haitian bilingual counselor, okay? And it is, very disheartening to see all of these cuts. My kids have holes in their schedules right now. As of right now, my students are only eligible to take math, gym, and math, gym, and maybe one ESL English class. After that, there will be holes for the rest of the day. 
Okay, so I just wanted to say that as a parent, as a resident, as an educator of this district, it is miserable, it's disheartening, it's, dis it's depressing, and morale is very, very low in the high school. Everyone who is teaching is there because they love their jobs, they want to be where they are, they do not want to be anywhere else but Brockton High School. Okay, anyone who's in this position. So to have jobs cut, to have these classes cut, I don't know what to say anymore because we are one phone call away from the Department of Justice coming in and telling us what to do with the budget. Um, seeing no further speakers, uh, motion to adjourn public oh. hearing. Oh, okay. Ma'am, could you just tell me your name? Anna you? Anna, A N N A? Yes. R O? A M B R O S E? Ambrose? Yep. And address? 88. 88. Quincy Ave. Quincy Ave. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm not in the school district as an employee at the school district, but I am a parent that my daughter is in a Brockton school. Not only I'm worried as a parent with a budget cut, because that's the future of our children. As a Brockton, we stand one. It's one Brockton. What can we do to come together to stop this budget cut? Not only it's affect our children, it's affect us as a parent. It hurt me, it breaking my heart for the school department. George School sent me a, a note, a form to fill out what school I want my daughter to go. I personally picked two school. It was the reason why that I picked two school. Last week I received a letter saying my daughter is going to Easter Junior High which I, not, I do not choose to go to that, for her to go to that school, and she will not go to that school. I called the school department. The person to pick up the phone was very rude, telling me they need to fill the seat at the Easter Junior High. I have no choice because that's how the school works. I said, wait a minute. You don't know who you're talking to. I have the, ch the choice to pick where, my, where to send my daughter and where my daughter will go to school. She asked me, all you have to do is come to the office and sign a pill form. Before I asked for her number, her name, she hung up the phone. I, I'm home now, recovering from surgery. I put my sweatpants, went to the school department, asked to speak to Kathleen Smith. I was told she was not available to speak with me and I need to fall in the chain of command. How can I find, uh, fall in the chain of command when the people you have at the front line have no morale at all to hang up the phone in a parent like me? I'm very disappointed as a parent. I, I want everybody in this room to listen to what I'm saying. I do not want to see this happen to any parent in Brockton or any district because we are the voice in our children's future, not the school department. And we work together as one block to, to bring this budget together. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing no further speakers, uh, motion to adjourn the public hearing. Motion to adjourn the public hearing. A second? Second. All in favor? Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. All right. Call the Finance Subcommittee meeting to order. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Smith. Um, would you like to frame the issues for finance? Um, our, well, a, a couple of things. Um, one thing in listening to the comments uh, from the audience, I'm so pleased that uh, we're seeing uh, advocacy on behalf of our public. I agree that our parents, our teachers, our residents are truly the backbone of the Brockton Public Schools. So uh, a couple of things I will address. As far as the budget books, we do have the budget barometer and we've had that up there since March because that is what we're working off of. As far as the big book, the actual budget book, 
It is at the Brockton Public Library. We've certainly shared that with our union from day one. They have had all of the information that we have going through this process. Um, the budget is not finalized at this point, but at any time anybody would like a copy, we will make copies available through our chief financial officer. There certainly is transparency. We have had budget meetings every single Tuesday night, every single Tuesday night since March of 2017, I want to say beginning of March. So we have met in open session. Many of you have been there. Uh, you've watched the process, and the process was explained very openly in the beginning. One of the first things that we were doing when we were given a budget figure of uh, right away of a $16 million deficit was you have heard me talk about every time I open up any finance committee meeting, it is talk about advocacy. It has been advocacy at every single level. Myself, Aldo Petronia, we've run into Boston. We've talked to speakers of the House. We've talked to Senate presidents. We've talked to the mayor has talked to I, the governor and the lieutenant governor. I have not. Uh, we've talked to committees. We're part of anything that could make a difference in our budget with those items that are truly affecting our budget when you talk about a $16 million deficit. Throughout this process, one of the first things that we looked at, when you're looking at $16 million, and somebody said it to me, and a school committee member mentioned it to me this evening. The past couple of years, we have cut, certainly, into our budget, and we've gone beyond cutting into the bone, I think was the comment that we've made. So in looking at the budget this year, one of the very first things we did with $16 million was we sat down for hours and looked at every single program we possibly could to not have bodies out of the classroom. Things that are basic curriculum, things that you expect in your classrooms, things that any good school department would have. Curriculum that continues from a reading program for kindergarten and first graders now to add them as we go along. Science and technology, which is tested on MCAS. All of these things, and people that have been at those meetings have heard how difficult these cuts are. The only balance we did try to find, and I talked about it, the poor middle school. You know, there are not middle school programs. There is no middle school intramurals. All things that every one of you find important, as I do for kids that are growing up in a city. We did try to sustain at the high school for those last four years as the students are looking to go to college and career. We tried to keep intact along with our academics, and I'll talk about that, to make sure they had opportunities for the arts because there are kids that that is their destiny or opportunities with drama, your band, your athletic programs, and some, some of your extracurricular programs. Those were things we were trying to balance. Many of you call school committee members and came before us, and you rightfully should, about programs that you felt were of value. Our International Baccalaureate Program, which we were questioning the number of students. It's a program that we're very proud of in this district. We talked about that cost. And it's shameful that it is such a difficult budget that those, the things that are successful are things that we're talking about cutting. We have a, a teen grad program for our uh, pregnant teens up at the high school. We've had it here for 30 years. Again, another program that was on the chopping block. We ended up making decisions about facilities, some that we had to make because of corrected action plans, but money, if you followed that process, that saved, and thank goodness, it saved about a million dollars in this process. But in the end, when it comes down to a $16 million deficit, and I made it very clear at the city council meeting when I presented before the budget hearing. I made it clear that although the city met foundation budget at $161 million this year, that last year at this time we had $167 million that was our meeting foundation. And if you take a look at every million dollars is 25 teachers. So if you look at that difference of $6 million, that's your 142 teachers that are presently out there. We also have out, as Kim Gibson mentioned, we have out paraprofessionals, the number is 94. We have monitor teacher assistants out, we have administrative assistants out, we have custodians out. Obviously less numbers because there are less numbers in those particular bargaining units. We have 22 administrators out. So this district has taken a huge hit. And again, while I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming up here, as difficult as it is to hear, what we do need right now is advocacy. And when you heard me at the city council, one of the things I talked about, and, and I really was surprised myself, that as superintendent of schools, I'm up there talking about 
a Proposition 2 and a half override, because I live here just like you do. And I don't have children in the schools anymore, but the one thing that I know for sure is when somebody, and I said this at the city council meeting, the budget hearing meeting, when somebody's buying a home in Brockton, there are lots of things they look at. They look at price points. Yes, they look to see if it's a safe place to live to bring up your family. But one of the most important things they look at is, am I going to get the educational services that I need from the school system? And that means reasonable class size. That means access to curriculum for kids. That means access to additional programs that we value in the city of Brockton. So the one thing you heard me say at that meeting, when there is not another penny to be had coming into our budget, and as I said, foundation budget is being met. I believe it's $700,000 over foundation budget. But you heard me talk about how difficult that is when there are still $6 million that we had a year ago that we don't have now. Never mind all the other additional struggles that we have had with the counting of the low-income students, which was another hit at, on the district. Um, in looking at that $6 million, it would, again, make a big difference in what our budget would be going forward. So Prop 2 and a half override is very real. And it gives me an opportunity, since uh, things were brought up this evening in the public hearing, that this is an opportunity, and every one of you came up here and said, we are one in the Brockton Public Schools. That means whether you're a parent, a teacher, a senior citizen that one day sent their kids probably through the Brockton Public Schools. And their kids, I'm sure, are successful. And I do not believe that for one minute, people out there, and if you heard me again talk before the city council, I brought out, and I don't care what your vice is, I've said this out there. I don't care if it's a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. I don't care what it is you spend on every day. Many of us go out and spend 3 and $4 on culottes or donuts or muffins or whatever makes our day a little bit easier. If you give that up once during a week over a one-year period for $5 with the average homeowner, we would be able to put together a two-and-a-half override with money that is earmarked so as we try to stabilize our school district, we can be assured that that is money that will come in to support our schools. So whether a charter comes in and we have extra money that, again, goes towards charter or school choice, which is what we got hit with this year. When you look at 161 million down from 167, that was the biggest calculation. The number of students choosing choice or charter was just about 4.5 million. I don't know that exact figure, but that was a huge hit. It was allowed to count towards our foundation budget and, again, made a big difference in how difficult our budget has been. So I appreciate your advocacy, and I hope you're going to be there with us because one of the things I was announcing tonight is we are bringing in attorneys to talk to us about how to frame a two-and-a-half override question. And it's something that, again, we're going to have to come together. We're going to have to talk to our neighbors, our friends. It isn't just about people that teach in Brockton. You know, many of you that teach here, many of you that don't teach here, have relatives, friends, because you look at any one of these neighboring towns, and I'm sure many of you are seeing what I'm seeing. I was told an override would never happen in Abington, and that is to build a school. I think it's a, a junior, senior uh, high school, middle high school, and yet that override passed. There are many of the surrounding towns that are building new high schools that are putting questions out there to the public and saying our kids matter. So when you see those lawn signs, Brockton Kids Count, it started out last year about an advocacy about counting our kids for poverty levels because of the hit we took a year ago. But it's much more than that. And if you look at the signs this year, it is Save Our Schools, Brockton Kids Count. So this is not finger pointing. This is everybody coming together and finding a way that we can stabilize our district, provide all of those things that we talked about. So I think my frustration in listening tonight is I feel that we have been very, very transparent. We will be happy to be more transparent, putting things out there, but we have labored over all of these decisions. What I will ask people, and I know how difficult this is when this is your job, your livelihood, your commitment to the children in the city, is we do not even have a state budget that is passed. You're a district, we're a district that relies on almost 80% of our funding from the state. We do have our initial figures, you know, that is obviously based on what we're dealing with. But we have been out there advocating, we're waiting to see what that final budget is. I have had open communication with the Brockton Education Association continually. And one of the commitments, and you've heard us talk about at every meeting, is our priority is to bring back those teaching positions. That is our priority. 
So it's difficult with two days left of school to have, you heard us talk the other night and I heard the question come up, 52 teachers and we had $600,000 that the school committee did not want to cut as we went through the budget process. And they made it clear that it was their goal to look at class sizes and to look at bringing back as many positions as we could. So what happened last Tuesday night at the budget hearing that we had, and many of you were there, we talked about those 52 positions and the decision was made that 30 would come to, from Brockton High School. There were 45 layoffs at Brockton High and I talked about this last week. 30 of those positions out of 52 would go to the high school so we could actually start to run a high school schedule at this point in time. Out of 42 at the middle school, 10 were brought back. And out of 83, and I want you to hear that number, 83 at the elementary, 12 were brought back, which brings it down to 71. And some of those, when I say elementary level, include adjustment counselors and some of your support people. So what we have asked at each of those levels with our executive director, our executive director of human resources, our principal and our administrators at the high school is to look at those positions and to, again, it's not bringing back everybody, but at this point that was our focus and was talked very openly last week. So I invite you to continue to come during the summer. We have budget meetings and we'll continue to talk to you about advocacy. We'll continue to talk to you about additional dollars and how they come in and how we try to build back our Brockton public schools. So I do understand, and I'm in the schools and I'm feeling the same thing that you're feeling. When I hear about the morale, it breaks my heart. This has been my livelihood and my dedication for 40 plus years. And those of you that know me know that I will fight to the last breath I have to talk about our district, what we need to have to run our district, and for every dollar out there to come into our children and our families. But I need people working together. We cannot be divided. We need to come together and advocate politically. We need to advocate at every possible level to make sure that you're getting the budget that our school department deserves. So I feel your frustration this evening. Um, and I will, uh, again, act to do whatever we can to make sure you have information, but as I said, we have been doing this since March, and we've been very open. I stand behind the process that we've had. I've had very open communication with the Brockton Education Association. I've made every, every document available to them. So please make sure, again, you come to us for anything. I will make sure Aldo Petronio's office has copies of whatever you would like to see in our budget process. Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, so folks that understand right now, this is a finance subcommittee meeting. I'm not a member of this committee. Tom is chairing this uh, because of the importance of the subject matter uh, is why I'm here. So just to add on to a few of the superintendent's comments and to clarify a couple of things, net school spending for the Brockton Public Schools this year is up $2.9 million. Chapter 70 local aid to education is only up 300,000. The city's local contribution to schools this year is up $2.6 million. It's almost the entire Prop 2.5 increase for this year. So to say that the city is not doing its share is not a fair characterization. Uh, the problem is at the state level. And the relief in the long-term solution is going to have to come at the state level. Cities like Brockton, as, as the superintendent explained, cities similar to Brockton all over the Commonwealth rely upon state aid for about 80% of their school budget. Give or take 1%, you can take any city across the Commonwealth, any gateway city, and it's 20% local contribution, 80% from state aid. And so we're level funded for Chapter 70 for all intents and purposes for three years in a row now. So if the 80% stays level for three years in a row while expenses are shooting up and our contributions are being more than wiped out by deductions for charter school tuition primarily, this is how, and I made the comment when I presented the city budget, 
that although the city is doing more, the schools are receiving less. And, and, and that both statements are true. The city is doing more, the schools are receiving less. So the superintendent is correct when she says that the foundation budget went down. Why? A $12.2 million deduction for charter school tuition right off the top. And take away $2 million of reimbursement, it's a net $10 million loss on charter school tuition. That number was under five last year. It's a more than $5 million loss in one year between charter school tuition deduction this year and last year. So that's how you can get a lower foundation budget because those dollars never get to the city of Brockton. The charter school tuition deduction is taken right off the top. So therefore the city cannot pass through dollars it received last year, but it's not receiving this year. So, you know, we have advocated at every level of state government for the past at least three months, if not longer. And we have met with the Senate President and the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor a couple times and uh, the Deputy Commissioner of, of uh, DESE and basically anyone at the state level that would give us an appointment to sit down and talk to them. We have pleaded the case of the Brockton Public Schools. This is why I think everyone up here opposed the charter school referendum question and opposed New Heights Charter coming to Brockton because we could see the future and we knew what the financial impact was going to be. So the issue with charter schools is not charter schools, the issue is how they're paid for. And right now this current administration is pushing very hard, promoting charter schools, but with a very unfair way to pay for them, basically balancing the cost of charter schools on the backs of poor urban school children. Because all the money for charter schools comes out of the cities that can least afford it. So the school districts that can least afford to contribute to the cost of charter schools are paying all of the cost. And we can see with what's, what's happened here. Um, so. I think the superintendent and I agree upon a lot more than we disagree upon. Mm -hmm. I think we're both just as committed. Um, I'm not advocating for the Prop 2 and a half override that the superintendent is because I don't think raising Brockton taxes is the answer. We're only 20% of the equation and we've substantially increased our commitment from last year. The problem is at the state level. The formula for determining the number of low-income students we have that now are called economically disadvantaged and somehow we lost a whole bunch in the change in terminology and the change in formula. And as the superintendent and I both agree very strongly on is that in 2015, the legislature uh, founded its own commission to study the Chapter 70 uh, reimbursement formula. <laughs> And if they would just follow any of their own recommendations, that report came out in October of 2015, and it says, we're not being fairly reimbursed for special ed students. We're not being fairly reimbursed for the cost of health insurance. We're not being fairly reimbursed for English language learners. Well, those are all Brockton. And so their own commission has told them that school districts like Brockton are not being fairly reimbursed in all of these areas we need them to take action at the state level. And I did commit in this year's budget to adding $100,000 to our um, city solicitors outside legal counsel budget for our contribution, hopefully to be joined by half a dozen other communities in filing an equity and education lawsuit against the state because we've got to do something to compel the state to accept the responsibilities that they have under the law you know, this isn't the McDuffie case this time. This has been decided by the courts and upheld by the courts. The state Supreme Judicial Court says every student in the Commonwealth has an equal right to an equal opportunity education, regardless of what community you live in and how good the tax base is in that community or how affluent the community is or what the community's ability to raise local property taxes is. And so I believe that's where the real relief is going to come. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen overnight. And I do sympathize with the superintendent's position in trying to figure out how to get schools open in September. 
with the money that we currently have to work with. And it is going to be painful and it's going to require tough decisions and it's going to require advocacy at the state level. So, you know, we're, I agree, we, we need to work together in resolving this and, and neither solution. A Prop 2 and a half isn't going to help this year either, Superintendent. Uh, that's not going to happen in time for this year. So we have to get this year's budget figured out. We have to make some painful decisions and we have to keep the best interest of, of providing education first and foremost. But I do think we also have to look at some of those programs that have been cut. Programs are, are we can't just cut all the programs either. So I think the school committee and the superintendent are going to have to take a hard look at some of those cuts over the balance of the summer also. And we're going to have to decide what our financial commitment is to transportation because there's not enough money for transportation either. So we will continue to look to try to identify funds. You're right, Superintendent, we're not going to have final numbers from the state till probably the second week of July. It's that way every year. Unfortunately, it's the, it's the system that we work in. Um, and on the city level, we will continue to try to identify any savings and funds that can be sent over either for net or non-net school spending. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, and again, you know, we haven't had a lot of time. We've both been busy with the budgets. Um, I did feel very good uh, about the conversations that I had with the uh, City Council going before them in the budget hearing. I felt many of them would stand along with us if we did look at a Prop 2 and a half override, because I agree that we do need to be looking at the state. We're not pulling back from any of that. But I think we as a city need to take a look at what it would take to stabilize our district as we're advocating at all other levels. And I believe in the people in the city of Brockton, when you talk about, again, we'll have to take a look at framing the question, making sure the amount of money is reasonable. I understand, and that has been a commitment in holding the line on property taxes to allow people to own a, a home in this city. But Mayor, you weren't here when we had just the discussion. And you know, to hear the frustration from your homeowners and the residents and what their expectations are for their children tell me that I cannot wait. And as I said, I feel very strongly uh, that there is support. I know you will join me in advocacy. We'll research it and take a look at a way to stabilize our district, continue to advocate at the state level, and find a way to uh, make sure we preserve an excellent school system. So that is my commitment. Just my final point, Mr. Chair, and then I'll stop talking, is that at the end of the day, 80%, 20%. If the 80% contributor is not doing their fair share, you can't fix it with the 20%. That's the reality. Just to point out, as someone in the audience did earlier, um, you know, I have my own selfish reasons, you know, with respect to making sure the uh, Brockton Public Schools maintains uh, its standard of excellence, um, not only you know, from my own uh, legacy of wanting to make sure the school system I came from uh, has a wonderful reputation, which it does, but you know, my son is gonna be a senior next year and you know, his schedule is in limbo right now, bottom line. You know, he doesn't know what math class he's going into yet. So believe me, you know, I know what everyone's talking about. Um, we all know what everyone's talking about. But <clears throat> we need to be unified. We need to be unified in this community. And um, we need, you know, as the mayor pointed out, and the superintendent pointed out in terms of advocacy, uh, the budget is not complete on Beacon Hill yet. So what I'd like to do, and we're going to discuss that later tonight, but we need to organize a um, protest on the steps of Beacon Hill. And I'd like to do it the week we get back from July 4th. That, that week, that second week, we need to be up there and we need to be unified. We need teachers, we need staff, we need school committee, we need um, you know, our mayor, our superintendent, our parents, and our students. Because we need to make a splash you know, I recall last year when the Boston public school kids showed up, played hooky one day, showed up on Beacon Hill. Well, there was some changes made to their benefit. Um, 
we need to, you know, we need to advocate for ourselves and we need to show up and, and basically shout it out to the governor's office that, you know, this is, this is unacceptable. This is, you know, uh, the criteria for the Chapter 70 Review Committee, Brockton hits every single, every single issue, especially the low-income students and the families that, um, you know, need that extra boost. And right now, with regard to low-income students, we are being penalized. And that was not part of this reorganization of that formula that was supposed to happen, that people uh, from uh, needy families were going to be hurt. And that's basically what happened. Their reworking of the formula hurts needy families of this community. And um, believe me, we're all, we're all in this together. We know we're on the same team. We want, we want all of the jobs back. Um, we want programs for kids. Um, but we need to let Beacon Hill know where we stand. And we need to advocate for ourselves. And we need to show up there in droves. Um, so, you know, we have to do it in time before that budget is set. And we need our voices heard. And I know um, people are frustrated. You know, people have made commitments in terms of um, relocating because of, we all know, the excellent reputation of this school system in this city. Um, you know, one s story, just to tell you, this morning I get a call from a close friend of mine who, against my wishes, sent his kid to an outside school district despite living in Brockton. He says to me, Tom, I hate it. I'm like, well, what do you mean you hate it? You know, you, you were all hot and heavy to leave the Brockton Public Schools. They're not friendly. The staff, the, the, the administration's not friendly. The kids are clicky. Everything's all about what you have, how much you have, what you're wearing. Uh, they don't welcome my kid in the groups because he's from Brockton. So the other kids aren't, you know, <laughs> welcoming him into the play groups. Uh, you know, he's trying to s sign up for sports programs in this community. And, um, you know, they know he's the outside kid, so he doesn't have the clickiness with the other parents. So his kid is, uh, you know, just things aren't going well. And I said, you know, well, I, I was against you sending the kid there to begin with. Bring him back. But what's happening with the budget? What's happening with the teachers? You know, I said, listen, you know, we're going to work that out somehow. But, you know, this school system is wonderful and, and it's wonderful because of all the people we have and that goes from you in the classroom to the lunch ladies to the custodians you know we 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 need to be in this together we can't divide each other and um you know we'll figure out we got to figure out a date to be heard and uh, we got to get into beacon hill you know very soon sooner rather than later um, so to me right after the fourth of july we need to be in there you know so we'll, we'll have further discussion, but I want you guys with us. You need to be with us. We have all been advocating to, to everyone who will listen. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's time that um, our voices are heard. You know, our voices are heard in this community, but they need to be heard, you know, uh, on the people that are making decisions that are hurting us by the millions. And that's really what it is. They are hurting us by, it's not a half a million bucks, a million bucks, 1.5. It's millions of dollars, as was just pointed out. So, so that's what I have to say. We're with two of our state representatives, so maybe a connection with all three of our state representatives and our state senator to find out what um, what is the calendar look like in the state house. I'm not sure when they're in there. Uh, with their hands, you obviously want to make sure that the governor is present or that your voices are heard by somebody there. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, Anyone else? No? All right. Uh, Mr. D'Agostino. Uh, yeah, and I'm kind of on the opposite end of where Mr. Minicello is as far as where my child is. You know, I, I have a two-year-old, so I'm looking at this going, what's going to be left? Um, and so I just want everybody to know, I believe me, as a parent, I'm thinking the same things you are and worried about the future and what kind of education system is going to be here um, you know for Evan and kids his age that are that are just a few years away um, and unfortunately and I hope to be wrong on this 
but I appreciate that the mayor put that money into the budget because I, unfortunately I think we're going to have to go to court to settle this and that unfortunately is a, a longer term or longer time fix. Um, but um, we need to, as Mr. Minicello said, get up to Beacon Hill physically, but also the phones need to be lighting up there too. I mean, they, they need to hear our voices and hear that we are tired of this. When they first did economically disadvantaged and they did the whole hold harmless thing, I, I guess maybe foolishly my hope was they know they messed this up. They're going to take this year to figure it out and straighten it out. Well, they didn't do it. And now it's time for them to hear from us, but it can't just be the seven of us on the school committee. It, it really does have to be everybody. Um, I, I couldn't agree with Mr. Minicello more on that, but I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the longer term picture and, and thinking, well, I mean, what, you know, if something doesn't change, what's going to be here in three, four, five, ten years? And I am hearing from constituents, former constituents, because they're leaving. So we are getting to that point where people are leaving this city because of this. And so it, it's got to be dealt with. And those of us that are still here need to make our voices heard. And we need to be loud. You know, it's the old saying, I'm, I'm, I'm loud, loud, mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. That time has come. And I, I hope we can all work together and make that, make that message heard loud and clear at, at Beacon Hill. Anyone else? No? Okay, um, uh, we do need to uh, approve the numbers that we currently have, um, but I do point out that this is a moving target, but right now uh, we have made decisions based on the budget numbers uh, that we have to work with, and that is basically um, uh, the only monies that we can <laughs> allocate. You know, you can only spend what you have. so. Um, I need to make a motion to approve the FY18 net school spending budget of $161,043,295 as uh, proposed by the finance subcommittee of the school committee. Regretfully, motion to approve the $161,000. I'm sorry, 100. 161 million, 443,000. Uh, sorry, 161 million, 43,295 dollar budget. Okay. Um, I need a, it was, I need a second on that. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Okay, and uh, further with regard to non-net, uh, we need to entertain a motion to approve the FY18 non-net school spending budget request of $10,172,63, um, which breaks down to $8,672,63 from local funds and um, $1,500,000 from um, outside sources proposed by the Finance Committee of the School Committee um, for a total of $10,172,63. $10,172,063. Okay. Uh, someone second that? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Um, any further business? No? Okay. We will take a one minute recess. Uh, motion to. All in favor? All right. Okay. Thank you. For everyone, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, I'll go in this order. 
So good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, regularly scheduled meeting of the Brockton School Committee. We open each meeting uh, with an opportunity for members of the public to speak directly to the school committee, the superintendent, and the mayor. And tonight we've had several people sign up uh, asking to be heard during hearing of visitors. I remind everyone the ground rules for hearing of visitors. Please limit your comments to three minutes. We ask everybody to stay to three minutes. All matters are taken under advisement. There's no direct immediate response from the school committee, uh, but everyone will be listening and paying close attention to the comments that are made. So, whoops, one more sign up. You didn't get signed up, Dr. Rosa? Yeah. All right, we're gonna let you get under the wire. Um, but you're last. So we'll start with uh, the first person I believe who signed in was Faith Tobin. I really did not intend to speak twice tonight. And this is a preview of what I wanted to say in front of the city council. But since these were both brought up by the superintendent and the mayor at the finance committee, I want to address them. Funding the foundation budget is not an obligation. It's an investment. Many mayors previous to you have exceeded foundation funding by millions of dollars in the times when our, our budgets were, were better and were worse, when we were, had financial problems. I've looked, I've done so much research in the last few weeks and I found budget after budget in the past that had exceeded foundation. I sat at the Friday night city council meeting where committee after committee after committee had a rubber stamped level funded budget. There had been no cuts taken from anywhere. So I'm going to tell you, Superintendent Smith, as far as an uh, uh, override, it's hard to get people on board for an override when they feel like their city is not already committing the funds that they need. I would support an override to redo Brockton High. I would support an override for capital investment. But right now, we are not investing. We are meeting obligations. And last year, we didn't even meet the obligation. I found the letter from Superintendent Chester that said we were one million shy of our foundation budget last year. So until we can learn how to even out the cuts and not work with just one, one department that takes all the hits. De last week, uh, department after department after department came up and rubber stamp, yep, level funded or, or several, in, in several cases, there were actually increases as far as other major departments were concerned. So I am all with you with advocating for the state. I'm all with you, you're right. But I also think we need to advocate for the city because that's my tax dollars that I want to see paid for my schools and not just for this or that to meet everything else. Minor adjustments to other city budgets could have fixed this. We're not talking, we're, you know, I'm not, we wouldn't have filled 16 million, but as you said, 4 million is several teachers. So until that happens, I don't feel like we're all on the same page. I don't feel like we're all in this together. There are a lot of you that are, but until everyone is on board and speaking out and saying this, I don't know why no one is saying this in the city council, no one's saying this, but it took me about three nights of extensive research to look at the budgets. The mayor's office budget has increased by several hundred thousand dollars in the last three years. So that's not taking any cuts. I'm not sure what that's about. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Linda Cahill. Dear Mayor, uh, Madam Superintendent, School Committee members, I need to advocate for our students and our staff. I'm Linda Cahill, nursing supervisor. I would like to express grave concerns about our staffing levels in the nursing department. Currently, we have 31 nurses and 10 health paraprofessionals. Given the budget crisis, it has been proposed that the health department be cut to 30 nurses and four health paraprofessionals. The Department of Public Health recommends one nurse per 500 students, regular education students and one nurse per 250 students with special education needs. 
given our population of over 17,000, 2,658 whom present with special education needs, we should have a minimum of 34 nurses. Our health paraprofessionals assist the nurse in simple first aid treatments and mandated health screenings, entering data, making phone calls to parents and to doctor's offices. The health paraprofessional covers for the nurse while she's at lunch and occasionally a health um, para has to cover school when there's not sufficient staffing. And that turns out to be maybe every other week, at least once every other week. Let me share some statistics from this year of how busy our health offices are. This year, we've seen 155, 155 um, 457 student encounters alone, 675 staff encounters, 29,402 uh, medications administered that are scheduled, and then 18,000 doses that are not scheduled. We've had made 33,282 um, parent um, contacts. There are 26 hundred students that have asthma, an asthma diagnosis. We have 38 students with a diabetes diagnosis. We have uh, 333 students that have an EpiPen, which is a life-saving um, medication for anaphylaxis. Brockton Public Schools has a return to class rate of 93.3% this year, which is slightly better than the state average. The last uh, documented was 93.1% in 2012. As you can see how valuable our health um, office personnel are in caring for the students and staff. The Brockton Public Schools health office staff are small in numbers but have a huge, have huge responsibilities. The loss of even one nurse or one paraprofessional is a real concern in how safely and efficiently and effective we deal with our students and staff. I would appreciate any consideration to restore our staff to full capacity, and our nurses are calling and writing to our legislators in the, in the governor um, of Massachusetts. Thank you for listening to my concerns. Are there any questions? Our next speaker is Mike Sullivan. Good evening. This apparently is going to be the first time I speak in the last 180 days where there's not going to be any give and take back and forth. Um, anyway, my name is Mike Sullivan. I've been a Latin teacher here in Brockton for 16 years at four different schools, Brockton High, East, North, and Davis. Uh, I could go through a million statistics as to why Latin is important, but you know they help with math scores, help with ELA scores. According to the uh, Princeton Review, uh, kids who major in Latin or double major in Latin and something else have the highest acceptance to medical schools, and they tie with math majors for the highest uh, acceptance to law schools. So obviously it's something valuable, but just to kind of bring it down to, um, you know, an individual experience. Every time I tell somebody that I'm a Latin teacher, the first thing they say is, oh, you must teach at Boston Latin. And I say, no, I, I say, no, I don't. And they say, where do you teach? I say, I teach in Brockton. And they say, well, you must teach in a private school. And I say, no, I don't. I teach in a public school. Then they say, well, you must teach at the high school. And I say, no, I don't. I teach at the middle school. And they always come across or come off as surprised by that. And I say, yeah, we have an excellent program. We have 30, 40 kids a year get scores in the National Latin exam. Um, <clears throat> and everybody always comes away impressed with that, like, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, also, I live in Boston. And as several people, I'm sure everybody here knows, Boston has several charter schools. We have one we deal with here in Brockton, and it's costing us a fortune. But think if we had, like, I don't even know how many we have up there. Every day I drive past the Edward Brooke Charter School, which is listed as one of the top in the state. When we cut programs, whether it's IB, whether it's foreign language, whether it's uh, you know, music or art or science or anything like that, 
we only open ourselves up for more attacks from charter schools. I have neighbors who send their kids to charter schools, and I've had like some tense conversations with them as to why, and they always say, well, I like the program they have there. I like that they have this. I like that they have that. Sometimes they don't consider that they could find that in a regular public school, but that's what they're thinking about. The more we cut, the more we fail to invest in what we have in programs here, the more charter schools are gonna look at us as a target. And instead of dealing with one, you're gonna be dealing with a few, and every kid that leaves, make, it, it becomes a spiral. Uh, lastly, I just wanna point out that I have friends who teach in the suburbs, and every once in a while, somebody will say, well, I have a kid, uh, Latin teachers who teach in suburbs, and they'll say, I have a kid who knows Spanish, so they're doing really, really well. And I say, really? I have kids who speak Creole, kids who speak French, Portuguese, uh, Spanish, Arabic, Amharic. Every year I hear of at least one language I didn't even know existed. Um, our kids have a lot of things working against them. A lot of kids come uh, from backgrounds where math or English may be a little bit more difficult for them, but their strength in this district is their languages. Instead of you know, worrying about what we should cut, we should take a look at what's really giving them an advantage over their suburban counterparts and fund that is, you know, max it out to as much as we can. And uh, like I said, I live in Boston. If you guys are gonna have a rally in there, let me know, I'll definitely be there. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is John Williams. It's like an awful lot of stuff in three minutes, John. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I promise to keep it short. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Williams. I am the founder and program director for the Champion City Mentor Program here in Brockton. Uh, our program has been active in supporting the Brockton public school system for the last three years. Um, next to me is my wife and co-worker Maya Williams, who has 15 years of experience working with Brockton youth, mother of five. Uh, behind me, I have William L. Wells, who is our Brockton High Manager. He has 20 years of experience working with youth. He's a youth minister, um, two degrees, father of two, and husband here in Brockton. Jaime Andre, who couldn't be here tonight, has almost 20 years of experience working with youth in Brockton. He speaks four languages, father of three, <coughs> and uh, husband here in Brockton. Uh, Steven Sampson, who's a Bunker Hill grad, father of two, could not be with us tonight. Damian Reyes, who was a 2010 grad of Brockton High and a man, was a manager of two U-Hauls before working with us. Uh, tonight, I want to speak to the school committee and the city of Brockton, the community, about our program. Um, it hasn't been promoted too much because we really wanted to grow organically, but we've been exist in existence since 2012 where we volunteered to do groups with Gateway to College. Uh, we still continue to do groups volunteering at Gateway to College um, every Friday during uh, their uh, semesters at Massasoit. We, were in, we went into Southeastern Regional uh, in the 2012-2013 school year. Uh, we worked with many youth there. Uh, we just, we've been outside of Southeastern Regional for the last, for almost two years, but we just graduated our last major group from there this year. Uh, we graduated about eight students sti still remaining in that school. Uh, we've been in Brockton for three years. We started with the 37H program in the afternoon um, and last year, for the last two years, we've been district-wide. We currently serve 14 schools in the district. We support those schools, um, which is Brockton High School, Hancock, Huntington, Downey, Angelo, Raymond, Pluff, Arnone, East, West, North, South, FDA, and Champion. And I do also currently still volunteer for Gateway and I volunteer for Southeastern Regional as well. This year we have mentored over 320 students individually and in group settings. We have provided over 60 home visits. Uh, we have 
<coughs> also done over 50 court escorts, translation services via phone and in person for six district schools to communicate with parents. We've also worked with parents on techniques on how to better work with their children and better communicate with the schools. Uh, the job that we actually do cannot be quantified within three minutes. It can't be quantified here. Um, I don't think there's actually anyone in the district that can keep up with everything that we provide. Um, this is something that is brand new, cutting edge, you really will not find a program like this anywhere, specifically because it has been tailored to our schools. Each school in the district has its own culture, and we tailor our program to each school. When we go into the Huntington School, we work with their students in the way that their principal and their adjustment counselors would like us to work with their students, and we find a way to, to make things work. And district-wide, we've had tremendous results. I just want to um, also recognize uh, Linda Texera Reyes, who has worked for, with our program since its inception and um, has provided so much for us. Um, she is no longer with our program, but has provided so much um, to us. Uh, and I want to leave you guys with a letter written by Stephen Shaw and Alice Williams, the principal at the Hancock and an adjustment counselor at the Hancock. And I also want to mention the Huntington School, who is looking within their own funding to help fund our program because they know that it is needed within there. And um, we know that we work within these schools and we are so effective because we work in a district where, and we're mainly based in the high school, we work in a high school where we have 312 white teachers, 57 black teachers, 12 Hispanic teachers, four multi-race, seven Asian teachers. And we have 62% of, of the population in the high school is black. 18% is white, 12.5 is his, are Hispanic. And operating from the similarity hypothesis, we can see why it is that we get across to a lot of these lost students. Um, but to read uh, from Stephen Shaw, we, we love the work that we do at the high school level. It's, uh, to me, unparalleled. Uh, but our real work in the elementary schools is going to show so much promise in the future. We see that we have diverted the path of some of our youth from the prison pipeline to the academic pipeline, to the secondary school pipeline. Um, coming from Stephen Shaw and, and Miss Alice Williams, to whom it may concern, our students come to school each day faced with a variety of issues. In order for them to be successful, many of our students need more individual attention and mentoring than they usually get during the school day. Given our larger and larger classroom numbers, John and his team give identified students guidance and encouragement which helps the students to achieve their goals and make progress with their behavior. Some of our most difficult students have made significant progress on their problem behaviors while working with John and the team. Our students love to see John, Linda, and the team and look forward to their arrival each day. Our students look up to the staff at Champion City Mentor Program with great respect, especially Program Director Mr. John Williams. His appeal is quite large amongst our most difficult students. John's warm smile but firm approach to dealing with issues is a win-win for our most difficult students. As a staff, it is comforting to have John and his team come into our building with extra energy and enthusiasm to support the neediest students. Their impact on our students, faculty, and families have been great, extremely positive. They help make our jo jobs so much easier. We are very lucky to have access to this program. Thank you, John, and your team for all that you do for our students. Keep up the wonderful work. Um, and that is from Mr. Shaw and Ms. Williams. Uh, honestly, 
I, I'm coming before you because we can't operate in 14 schools and do all the work that we do if our staff is reduced. We need, I, I need at least seven staff members to maintain the level of services that we have already started to pr provide here in Brockton. And we're asking that we keep, uh, we at least maintain the staffing that we have uh, this year for the program because we are investing in our young people. We are investing in our future. Uh, this program was, in its inception, was brought um, and created specifically for our lost youth. And a lot of them are our black minority male students. And this program was specifically built for that because I am a Brockton kid. I came, I went through the Payne School, East Junior, East Middle School, and Brockton High. I was removed from Brockton High and put in FDA. I've been through the prison system in Massachusetts. I've been through the rehabilitation process in Massachusetts, and I have been through the streets of Brockton and know what they face on a daily basis. I don't want for any more of our students to have to go through the path that I did to success. I want for our students, and I hope for our students, and I know there are so many people in this room because I've worked with Superintendent Smith, I've worked with Mr. Mike Thomas who taught me over at East Junior High, uh, worked with Tom Minicello and a lot of the teachers, Sal Tarasi, a lot of the teachers that are here, working with Miss O'Brien at the Huntington, Mr. Shaw, uh, Dr. DeSilva over at East. These are people that are invested in our young people. They do not want to send our kids to alternative schools. We want to graduate more mainstream students because, and I, I do say that about our minority male youth because our statistics show that we've had 156 dropouts last year uh, at the high school level. 80 of them, that's over half, were black students. 102 of them, that's almost half, were male students. We, we have to do better and we have to fund the things that are making a difference. Trust me, I'm not doing this for a program to make some money. If this wasn't working, I would recuse myself from, from being in the district. I wouldn't work this program if it didn't work. I'm before you today asking that we maintain the funding level because we see that it works. Not only me, you can go district wide and ask principals that we, in the buildings that we work in, this program is working, it's helping our youth, and we need our community to step up and support it, and we need to support programs like this. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Amina Pilgrim. Mayor and Superintendent, thank you for your email. School committee, um, thank you for this opportunity. However, I will um, give up my time so that Dr. Rosa can have that spot. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, Superintendent Smith, and members of the school committee, this is not the first time that I've come before the school committee. The last time I came, it didn't work out so well. I guess we were on the opposite sides of issues, and I guess this is a repeat of that. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for listening to me for a few minutes. And Brother Williams, I want to congratulate you. I don't know where you are on your program. Um, but I wanted to speak to you a little bit about some of the cuts that have been made. Um, I have, I'm a teacher educator. Uh, most people know that my field of expertise is education, or some people know, uh, and I have some excellent colleagues over here, teachers, counselors. They have been working with students in Brockton for a very, very long time, very dedicated people. But I, I'm not here speaking to you as a teacher educator or someone who has read research on education or anything like that. I'm here to speak to you as a parent because I have two kids in the Brockton school system. And I have to tell you that 
the cuts that have been made, particularly to the bilingual ESL department, and I, I, of course, I'm concerned about the cuts that have been made all the way around in education. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while, but I'm particularly concerned about the cuts that have been made in the bilingual ESL department, that uh, most of those figures have been posted online. I have to tell you that uh, it's myopic in nature. Uh, those cuts are myopic in nature, and they flagrantly violate the law. Because when you have eight teachers in a department that you're laying off, you're the laying off eight teachers, six of whom are ESL teachers, that means that next year, 300 students are not gonna have ESL classes. That violates the law. It's plain and simple. Now, I've heard the mayor speaking about the issue of the case being settled in the courts. I've heard a couple of other people uh, Mr. Diagostino mentioning uh, the issue of the courts. And I think you're right. I think that's exactly how it's going to end up being worked out. Because I hate to tell you, but we're not all in the same boat. Yes, we're in metaphorically, but we're not all in the same boat. Because if somebody's parent has the choice and the privilege of taking their kids out of Brockton to put them in another school district, not everybody has that choice. And if you're gonna stick a knife in my back, pull it out two inches, and then tell me they were friends, no, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. It, it, these issues violate the law. The Department of Justice, DESI, would not tell every town in Massachusetts that services ELLs to mandate retail initiative across the board for all teachers, and then for cities to cut out 43% of a department, most of whom are ESL teachers. It just doesn't work like that. I'm telling you that passing this budget violates the law. And I'm glad that the camera's here because this is on record. If you pass this budget as it stands, you are violating the law. I think Ms. Cajus was speaking about a phone call away from the Department of Justice. I think she's right. I think she's right. And if somebody said once that the way you measure a society is by looking at how you treat the most underprivileged, this is a model case to be looked at. You cannot eliminate 11 classes out of a curriculum that services 400 students, but keep an IB program that services 11. Now, this is not about divide and conquer. It's not about pitting one program against another. It's not about that. But it's about you understanding that this city is not changing. The poor kids that are in the city, they're not going anywhere. The city is not changing. And if you make the myopic decision of passing the school budget now, the city will pay for it later on down the road. You may not be here. Your kids will be living here. There are a lot of people back here, every time there's a proposed budget cut, a lot of people showed up in school department meetings, and that's not normally the case. But I'm gonna tell you that this is a case where you can make this decision now and pay for it very dearly later on. Because if you're making the options to cut out the teachers that work with the students that most need it will come back to haunt you. The city will end up paying for it later on. And the whole question, I heard somebody mentioning legacy. The whole question is, what legacy do you want to leave in the long run? Now, I know that the state is cutting down aid for all cities. Um, I agree with that. I believe Mr. Mayor in that. The state's cutting out aid for all cities. Nevertheless, 
the budget as it stands and the way that it disproportionately affects students cannot pass. Because as Ms. Kajou said, the Department of Justice is just a phone call away. And we know this because the Department of Justice has been in Brockton before, so we know that. And I plead with you to sit down, think, do exactly what you said when you were running for the school committee, and look at solutions. Look at creative solutions, look outside the box, think outside the box, but come up with something that's more reasonable. Do not penalize those students. They bear the greatest cost in the city to begin with. And thank you very much for your time and for listening. I would like to offer, just as a point of clarification, that the budget being passed tonight is simply the number, the number of the budget. There is still a considerable amount of work to be done by the school administration and the school committee as to how that money is spent within that budget. And those decisions typically go well into the summer. And I think that's why the superintendent was also referring to uh, trying to get a firmer number from the state as to what our final chapter 78 may be. So by quote unquote passing the budget tonight, it's simply approving a number. How that money will be spent within the budget is determined by the superintendent with guidance from the school committee. Okay? All right. Let me get back to the agenda. So that I believe completes our hearing of visitors. And we'll move on to our regular business of the evening. The school committee, are there some folks that are going to leave? Because I'll take a quick one minute recess if there are folks who would like to leave. No? Okay, just making sure. So the school committee conducts uh, its routine business at each meeting uh, by way of a consent agenda. The consent agenda is a block of uh, items that will be considered as one. However, each, any school committee member may request that any individual item in the consent agenda be removed from the agenda for individual discussion. So at this point, I'll ask if any members of the school committee would like to remove any of the items from tonight's consent agenda. Hearing none, I'll accept a motion on the consent agenda in its entirety. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda in its entirety. Motion's been made and properly seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Opposed? <coughs> Passes unanimously. Uh, the next item is, do, actually, Superintendent, yes. can I let you take the lead yes. on that? Okay. The next is under communication. Uh, the school committee received uh, information uh, from uh, Mayor Carpenter for funding support for the city's uh, Summer Pox Initiative. Again, it's been a very successful program for uh, our students to have someplace safe to go during the summer, um, supervision with uh, park instructors, activities for students. At the June 13th Finance Subcommittee meeting, the committee voted to favorably recommend this to the full school committee for approval. Uh, the mo uh, motion to approve would be a donation of $20,000. It comes from Chartwell Food Services, and it is part of their community outreach fund for the Brockton uh, Summer Park Initiative. Um, Chartwells has been a very good partner to the Brockton Public Schools and this is obviously a, a very generous contribution that is going to help a lot of a lot of children this summer uh, be in a, you know, a safe environment and also uh, provide them with um, healthy and nutritious uh, food um, during the uh, program uh, so I would a like to you know publicly thank Chartwells for the um, contribution and their commitment to the well-being of you know, our students and the, and the children of Brockton. And um, I know, Mr. Mayor, you've been um, very um, instrumental in terms of making sure that uh, these programs are you know, funded and um, available for some of the kids that uh, may not have 
uh, you know, any additional or alternative alternatives for the summer. The Summer Parks program is for children ages 7 through 12. It's for a seven or eight week period during the summer. Half days. Last year we had four city playgrounds. Unfortunately, this year we have to consolidate to three. Uh, however, South Junior High, James Edgar Playground, and the Ash Street Playground, uh, we serve a healthy breakfast and lunch. There's absolutely no charge. Everything is free. We're able to give some high school and college students summer jobs. And, uh, and I want to thank Chart Wells. Uh, they have uh, each year for the last, uh, I think, three years made a $15,000 contribution. This year they've increased it to 20. So my thanks to Chart Wells for their support. All of the funding for the Summer Parks program is privately raised. There's no taxpayer dollars being used. We have a couple of great corporate citizens like Chartwells and Republic Services that make significant private donations. And we also do fundraising with the golf tournament and a couple of other things. So uh, the idea behind this is to give younger kids, particularly many of whom may be latchkey kids, may have single parents or both parents working in the summertime, and really targeting youth that may not have the resources to go to an expensive summer camp to have a safe place to go on weekdays during the week and be looked after and get a, a couple good meals. And uh, we bring them to the swimming pool twice a week. We bring them to a rocks game. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty good program and it's offered at no charge to any Brockton resident age seven through 12. So if you know anyone that might like to take advantage of that, uh, we begin the week after 4th of July. So uh, having said that, I might again my thanks to Chart Wells, and I'll accept a, uh, a motion on the request. Motion to approve requests for the um, Summer Parks Initiative uh, funding for this summer. Second. Motion's made, properly seconded. All in favor? <coughs> Approved unanimously. Thank you, everyone, for your support of the Summer Playground Program. OK. At this point, uh, I will turn the meeting over uh, to the superintendent for the superintendent's report on teaching and learning. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this, uh, at this time each year, uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to recognize uh, volunteerism in our community. Many of you know about the Albert N. Baroncelli Award. Uh, it's an award that has been in the district close to 40 years. Um, it's in honor of Albert Baroncelli, who was actually part of um, the community school program and thought that volunteerism was the key for a community to serve its youth uh, and to certainly serve our, our, our children throughout our district. So I'd like to invite uh, the director of community schools, Laurie Silva, to come up and to talk to us about this year's recipient, a recipient from the George School, uh, Jolene uh, Sarcia. She is uh, part of the George School PAC. I've had the opportunity to, to attend many events that Jolene has been a part of and a very worthy recipient. Laurie? Thank you. It is a great pleasure to, to have honored um, Jolene uh, recently at the PTA meeting, but also here again tonight. During her leadership tenure, she's been involved in the planning and implementation of many past um, and present events at the George School. School dances, harvest, Halloween, Valentine's, and, and Hawaiian luau events. Many such things has she done for the school, um, and all with great pleasure. Also during her tenure, she has been instrumental in fundraising for the George School, raising over $50,000 for the school's educational programs, field trip busing, school signs, teacher supplies, etc. That's a huge, huge undertaking. What is staggering is how the efforts of this one person, this one particular person, can truly make a difference in volunteering, in volunteerism in the community. So Jolene.
about her efforts at the George School. Hi, welcome. I mean, thank you. I'm so honored to be here. I get very nervous speaking in public, so I actually wrote a little poem um, that I'd like to read right now. Um, PTA meeting, kindergarten year. Inside me, I feel that the moment is here. Step up to the front, toss my hat in the ring. Chime, time to check out this volunteer thing. Fundraisers, movie nights, dances, oh my. Why don't we give the Harlem Wizards a try? Book fairs and family nights, sharing with friends, building a community where fun never ends. Memories made, laughter fills the air, surrounded by parents who all truly care. Giving our children a place to belong, working together to make our school strong. Fast forward seven years to this very night, receiving this award, being put in this light, that one took the time to nominate me. I'm humbled beyond words, it's so hard to see. It's all so surprising, for how could this be? The reason I did this was never for me. I did this for them, for each little one, my two precious daughters, my one precious son. They are my reason to wake up each day. They are our future. We must lead the way. We must help each other every chance that we can. We must work together. We must understand. Together, we can accomplish unimaginable things. Everything counts, even small beginnings. PTA meeting, kindergarten year, everything then was leading to here. So many memories made along the way, so many friendships, so much I could say. Becoming involved was the very best thing. I can't wait to see what the future will bring. I'm honored to be here and accept this award. Thank you to Michael, thank you to the board. Thank you very much. Principal Natalie Cole out here, who has worked, worked very closely with her PTA, and thank her for uh, all her hard work and support. And next, uh, other good news, and you heard uh, Mr. Minicello talk about our food services provider, Chartwells. I'm not sure what else to say other than they truly are a partner and a collaborator in every sense of the word. And tonight, you're going to hear a little bit um, about the uh, about Chartwells, some of the improvements that have been made, and actually, I know uh, Tom Burke has some really good news to share with us about our, our food service workers, who again are uh, the backbone of the Brockton Public Schools. They make sure thousands upon thousands of your children, our students, are fed breakfast, lunch, snacks, special occasions. You know, you name it, they are always there. They're there Saturdays. They're there Sundays. They're there for all kinds of events. So I'm really pleased to invite uh, Director uh, Tom Burke to come up, and I know he has some, some things to share with us. I believe he's doing a PowerPoint to start. Yep. First of all, thank you um, for letting us have a few minutes tonight. Um, so what we're going to do is just do a little school year of 2016, a little bit of um, a photo journey of, of what um, the Brockton School Lunch Program did uh, this school year. Um, first of all, our team members, we, we have, Chartwell has uh, six staff members and an office manager. Our newest staff member is Kate Qualley, who's our, our, our regional dietitian. We have four directors and then we have an executive chef on hand, as well as our wonderful staff of 150 um, dedicated employees that uh, without them, we, we, wouldn't, we couldn't have done the things we've done this year. And then along with our um, support we receive um, from Erin Long, who's our Northeast Regional District Manager. Um, and many of you know Erin, she's been in the district since the start, um, along with Pete Zaffer. So most of our staff's been here for several years. Um, one of the things that we've, we've kind of done um, the last few years is we've formed youth advisory meetings. Um, and we, we do this throughout the district, um, middle school and high school. We do meet a couple times a year um, in the elementary schools. Uh, and these youth advisory committees, what the goal of the committee is, is really to um, get the students involved in food service. Um, and, and it's great for, uh, for us and for them. They, we kind of communicate back and forth of why would there's certain things we have to do. For example, why do we have to serve whole grain pasta with macaroni and cheese. Um, it's not, and, and so we're able to 
let the, communicate that to the students and they understand what, what and the reasons why we do this. The other thing that we do is um, through the YAC, we promote good nutrition. Um, get, um, we ask students to help us with different programs that we're doing throughout the district. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, and we're trying to, with the students, to make the food service the best it can be in their schools. One of the programs that we, we offer is, we call it Chef to School. It's a program, um, and really it's a hands-on cooking demonstration. Um, our chef, uh, Mike, and Kate, our dietitian, uh, they plan ahead of time, and they will go out and do a Chef to School demonstration. As you can see, Mike, um, in the up in the corner there, Mike is with um, Stephen Shaw, the principal at Hancock. Um, <laughs> He's also with Natalie Pohl in the middle there and over at Marseille, um, the principal over at the Angelo School. Uh, and what happens is we go, we go out, Mike, Mike will prepare a meal, um, and then Kate will set up a station, as you see the table there, with, with different components of the meal so the kids can actually see it, taste it, touch it while Mike's preparing it. And, and when they come through the line, Mike is behind there, and we have a little stove, and he's cooking it. And, and it's funny, the kids always want to know, are you on Food Network? Are you, you know, uh, can we, and we've actually, students have always asked Mike for his autograph. Um, be, be, and, and I think it's, it's a program that we started a few years ago and it really helps um, to let students know, you know, what they're eating and where the food comes from, local food. Um, and it's just a great way, again, to communicate with the students um, about school lunch. This year, we're happy to say we received several grants. Um, we're always looking at ways to, um, find some money to, to help the program. This year, um, we received $126,750 for fresh fruit and vegetable grant. Currently, we're operating that in the Downey, the George, and the um, unknown schools. Uh, and what that is, is each afternoon, or depending on the schools, we, we go out and we put, we have a cart full of fresh fruits and vegetables. We leave it in the hallway and students come up, they grab whatever they want, bring it back, and they eat the, the, um, the fruits and vegetables in the classroom. And it's, it's a great way, to, again, to introduce them to healthy snacks. One of the things that we did this year, which, um, you know, we, we offer a wide variety of different things. Some of the stuff that we, we didn't even know what it tastes like and when we brought it to them. And it was, so it's a great experience to introduce some new products to um, the students. We also received um, a, a DE, DESE equipment or a summer food service grant, which was $52,758. That was used for, we were able to put a new walk-in cooler at the Brookfield School to replace one that was probably 40 years old. Um, new ovens at East and West. Um, we put a complete serving line in at one of the schools. Um, so again, that money is used, we bring it back into the district and we're able to buy some equipment um, and, and, and help improve the food service. Um, we had, Kate had applied for a kid's, a kid's garden grant. We were, we were um, granted $1,000 for that. New England Dairy Council, $10,000 um, for New England Dairy Council, which helped us increase our breakfast in the classroom at some of the middle schools. They, they, we actually were able to buy some carts and offer some, um, as students came in, offered some grab and go type breakfast. Um, and then, then the Healthy Start Award, um, EOS Foundation has been a great partner with us for the last few years. Um, and each year, um, since we started breakfast in the classrooms, Schools that have received 80% higher in participation, they receive $500 per school and they can do whatever they want with them. And it was nice. This May, we, we went into the um, State House. They had a nice celebration and, and each school would receive a, a check for $500. Um, and, and that, so you can see the grants, um, you know, hopefully we have, we have applied again for the fruit, fresh fruit and vegetable grant and we'll look to continue some of these grants on the next year. Community eligibility provision uh, is a program that we started. This is our first year. Um, and this, is, this has allowed us to provide brec free breakfast, free lunch to every student in Brockton. Um, and and what, what we've done with that is, you know, with, that's how we've partnered with EOS Foundation and did breakfast in the classroom. Um, and this has been a great program. Um, we have seen, um, you know, not only, not only Financially, because what happens is 97% of our meals um, that we serve, the, the district's getting reimbursed at the free rate, which is the highest rate 
Um, and so financially it's helped, but it's, it's also, we, we have seen um, this year, we have, we're currently do, serving over 10,000 breakfasts a day and almost 14,000 lunches. So it, it's, and our, our meal counts, our in, in participation for breakfast, we're, we're in the 80 to 85%. Lunch, we're in the high 70s, which is really, um, it's, it's sort of unheard of in, in uh, that these percentages, and it's all because of the CEP program. The other thing, that what the CEP done, has done for us is it's given us an, an additional $1.6 million of reimbursement that we didn't have in previous years, and that's us, allowed us to purchase some new equipment and to keep the program and the equipment in the kitchens, um, you know, update them, and it's, it's been a, it's, and we, right now, um, we're, community eligibility will, we have for the next three years. And we have to apply for each year, but we're guaranteed for the next three years that re, um, all of our meals will be at 97% reimbursement rate. Um, and that, the nice thing, too, with that is there is no, no, nobody has to do free and reduced applications anymore. So with the beginning of school year, that, that whole um, application process goes away. All the kids come in from, this, from day one, they all receive free breakfast and free lunch. Um, just this year, we transitioned. Um, with um, the after school program and we currently, we took um, over all the after school program. We switched the programs um, a few years ago. We, we were going, we were doing a snack program. We moved everything to a dinner or a supper program. Again, um, that has helped us receive additional reimbursement money. Um, pr prior to that, the reimbursement for a snack was about 86 cents. Reimbursement for a, a complete supper program is $3.16. So you see, we, we, we're really, in, in real, it's nice that students get a um, different variety. It's all cold, it's packed to the high school and we ship it out every day. And, um, and it's been, again, a, a great um, addition for the program. And that's generated um, over $280,000 this year in additional um, reimbursement money back to the district. Um, the next slide is just, we like to have fun. Um, and you see that because of um, the Play Up Fuel 60 in, in New England Dairy Council and the grant that Kate wrote, um, Pat the Patriot came to um, the Ashfield School back in, I want to say May, um, and the kids had a ball. They, they, they had a, a farmer there and, and they had Pat Patriot and, the, and they, they did all kinds of different activities. I can see one of the pictures of the kids with the glasses on and, and whatnot. Um, in the top corner, we, at the Hancock School, uh, the kindergarten class got to come back to the kitchen one day and make their own pizza. Um, our, the middle slide is from our Angelo school. Uh, though they were given a hero award for the great job they did with breakfast in the classroom this year. Uh, and then we see, in the, in the one on the right is at, um, we did a Earth Day and we bought some canvas bags and let young kids decorate the bags and, and Kate went in and talked to them about recycling and, and, and so again, it, it's, and then the bottom slide is um, a gardening program that, that Kate did work with. Um, just now, and the next slide is just a, again, a couple pictures of having fun in, um, f fun in the district. Um, again, Pat Patrick over at the Ashfield, Food, Ashfield School. In the middle picture, that's our, one of our directors, Tom McNeely, having lunch with some kids, students, um, Dr. Seuss Day. He went in and, and, and then Halloween, one of our catering girls dressed up um, and as she's working, she's dressed up as uh, Hillary and, 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 and they had fun with it that day. So um, again, we, we like to get out to the schools and, and be a part of, of the schools. Um, and nutrition education has been a, since, we're so lucky to have Kate and, and Kate come on board. Originally, Kate was, stuck, was he, she did an internship for us and, came, and as a favor, came to Brockton one day for me to help, help in a, a classroom. And two years later, when we found out she was looking to come to work, we are like, we, we need to take Kate and put her on board. Um, she's done a fantastic job with nutrition education from, um, we, but we also do, not only with students, we do it with parents. Um, we do family cooking nights. Um, and you can see the picture of Chef Mike and Ken from the high school um, with parents, um, and they're, they're teaching them uh, how to prepare a meal, a simple meal. Um, and then we do a harvest of the month program, which is fresh fruits and, and different um, smoothie days and things. And, and 
Kate and, and Mike and Ken and, every, and, the, and all of the Chartwell staff um, go out to the schools and they really promote um, nutrition education. And, um, and, and it's, gone, it's, it's really um, been a big plus for us this year. But the real reason why we came here tonight was um, last year um, we, we decided that we were going to try to do something for the community. And we, we, had a, and I'm, we had a meeting and we said, why doesn't everyone do donate one dollar? Um, so every Friday, the staff donates a dollar. Um, and you know, we, the first year we thought, you know, how much money are we going to raise from a dollar per student, um, per staff? Well, as you can see, um, and we're back again this year because it's, it, we raised more money this year than we did last year. Our staff absolutely loves the program. Um, they, they are the backbone to, for, for us. Um, they're out there every day. They see what's going on, and they really know that, you know, um, the, the students and what's happening out there. So, so we have every Friday, the staff comes to work dressed. They dress down, and they donate a dollar, um, and, and we collect the dollars during the school year. Um, and then it's up to us what we want to do with them. We, we kind of all get together and decide, okay, how, we're gonna, how and what we're going to do with the donations. Well, this year, um, from, from, a, from one dollar donation for each employee, we, we um, raised over $3,500. So one of the things we did earlier during the year, John Snellgrove, um, and I had a conversation, and we, he was doing a, a dinner for champions over at the um, Shaw Center, and he had said that the, you know some funding was an issue, and um, so I went to Linda Mashnick and, and our, our staff and said, you know, can we do something for John um, in the in the breakfast of champ, uh, the sorry dinner for champions, and they, in the middle picture, um, in the middle of December, um, they gave a check to John for a thousand dollars. The, the, the top picture is um, Linda Mashnick and, and um, Debbie Connie, who's one of the managers at the high school, um, and they did a coat drive, a coat and hat drive, and they donated a bunch of coat, coats, I'm sorry, hats and gloves to a former school committee member who does a, who does a hat and coat drive um, during the winter. Um, one of the other things we did this year was, in, in the bottom picture in the left there, is a, a culinary instructor from Johnson & Wales College. They came into the key center, um, did a food demonstration, uh, and, and they did a fantastic job and, and got the kids engaged. And then our chef Mike and, and Kate um, ran a serve safe class. Um, and serve safe is something that uh, in food service it's a requirement. Um, and we're happy to say that out of the class we had three people, and it's a very difficult to. To pass, you have to have a 75 to pass, and we did for a whole semester, and we had three people pass. With two had a grade one, a grade of 88, one had a grade of 86, and one other student had a grade of 80. Uh, so we had three, we three. So these three students now can go out and get a job in a restaurant or, or start their career in food service. And yet in the middle picture there is last year, uh, blessing the backpack. Um, we we donated a two thousand dollar check to blessing the backpack. Um, so, as you can see, I, we're lucky that w the people that we work with and the staff that we have in, in food services, is, um, they're amazing. They, they never say no, um, and they're always willing to, to go the extra mile. Um, and the last thing is just breakfast in the classroom. Um, we currently, all, middle, excuse me, all elementary schools are doing breakfast in the classroom. We are now also serving breakfast at the gym. Um, and you, um, at the high school, and we have some grab-and-go carts um, at the middle school. And, and this has helped um, it, with, with uh, you know, obviously <coughs> offering and, and, and making sure that every student in Brockton starts the day off correctly with the breakfast. So, um, and with that, I, we do have a couple um, checks we want to give out tonight. Um, we have three. If, no, open the corner, you grab. We have three, and what I'd like to do, um, Superintendent, okay if I bring?
you know, the last day of school you're doing, and you kind of have a big part of making this happen. Um, our first donation tonight is, is from, we, the special needs creative um, creations. Where's Chris? So on, on behalf of Karen and all the, the lunch staff in, from, a, from the donations of Dress Down Friday, and this is a couple of Kristen's first, first students, we're, um, they're going to donate $500. so they can do the arts and crafts and sell them and things at the high school. <coughs> yeah. 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 Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Once a month, they come to the high school and they pack out meals for um, students on weekends, and they they pass them out every weekend, every Friday, so student Brockton students can go home with meals over the weekend. And, and um, so, it, it, how many meals are we doing? Uh, Three hundred ten by the end of this year. And I have to say, like we came here to the school committee, I think <coughs> it was three years ago, and we started supporting fifty kids at that time, and without Chartwell's help, <coughs> excuse me, we could have never spread as far as we did. And, we're still making just a small impact on the number of kids who could take advantage of this program, but uh, you know, I'm humbled by this because we couldn't do what we do without these great people. But this year, they're donating uh, again the, the school lunch program and the lunch uh, staff are donating a thousand dollars to Blessing and Pat. Last one, Mr. Snellgrove. This this donation, we we read an email from Michelle about camp and I and some some different fundraisers you were doing and things. So I approached again. I approached the, the school lunch staff and asked them, if, and and they said absolutely they would donate some money. So so we'd like to. Donate a thousand dollars to the campership fund. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I can't say enough about Chatwells. I just, I, from the bottom of my heart, I mean, they do so much um, every day. Um, their service is, is second to none on a daily basis. But then also. Uh, above and beyond that, what they do for our students. And I know when I'm struggling, looking for funding, and trying to help folks that are uh, that are struggling themselves, um, I can call Mr. Burke, and he can rally the troops at Chartwell. So thanks to all the staff and for everything they do for us on a daily basis. So I'll continue the good news. I want to thank Chartwells for their donations. Uh, and as uh, John said, it will support a lot of our students, um, students in camperships, our special needs programs, um, so many other opportunities that our children need. And moving on, um, I'd also uh, like to talk about um, educationally. We recently had our Huntington School uh, highlighted in a number of video clips, and I'd like to invite Principal Mary Beth O'Brien to come down. I'm not sure if she's bringing some of her staff members, or? They might be a little shy with their staff. Okay, well, let's, let's have them come down with you. 
and we're going to talk about uh, STEM and instruction uh, in a grant with the National Center for Time and Learning. And this was a, an initiative for elementary schools. It included schools in Fall River, Revere, and Brockton. And tonight we'd like to show you some of the highlights of the uh, Brockton uh, in the video clips. Good evening, school committee, Madam Superintendent, Mayor Carpenter, uh, Office of Teaching and Learning, and of course the Executive Committee. Um, thank you for having us here today. I know that the night has gotten a little long, so we'll try and be brief. Um, we are here on behalf of the Huntington Elementary School, and I'm sharing um, the microphone tonight with Allison Colarusso, Kathy Convey, and although she's a little shy, Dana Bellavo is in the back row. Um, and this work wouldn't be possible without them. Um, so we're here today to talk about how we at the Huntington School have enhanced opportunities for STEM education. Um, as you know, we began our work in redesign in 2009 under our former principal, June Saba. Um, and during that time, it was a real grassroots effort um, in order to engage our school faculty into a redesign project to really enhance any and all opportunities we have for our students. Um, as we've begun to really root our efforts um, into all of the practices aligned with the ELT conditions for effectiveness, we were awarded last year an opportunity to apply for a STEM ELT expansion grant. Uh, and I, I won't read each slide to you. However, um, the work allowed us to have some sponge money, if you will, to really invest in professional collaboration with our teachers, to look at all of our resources around STEM education, connecting them together and finding a way to really uh, have them serve as a catalyst to move our efforts forward in a way that would provide our elementary school students with some opportunities that they're not typically given at an elementary school level because of so many competing initiatives. Um, this work was funded through the Overdeck Family Foundation, and that's a private funder. The National Center for Time on Learning, which, which supports the national uh, movement around expanded learning time, and certainly Empower Schools, which has now taken on the work of the Massachusetts effort around expanded learning time schools. Um, within that work, um, I just to frame the work a little bit, there are 131 ELT schools in Massachusetts. Of that, only 31 of those schools are public elementary schools. And of those, the, the entire network of 131 schools, only eight schools were awarded this ELT STEM grant. Of them, four were elementary schools and only one from Brockton, as you can see. Um, and within that work, in terms of the schools that were supported for showcasing their work around STEM ELT um, work, the Huntington, the Sylvia School in Fall River, which are the two elementary schools, and one middle school was selected, the Collins Middle School. Um, during this time, our work was evaluated using an internal district level team. However, we were measured across the domains of success for ELT, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics standards using a quality diagnostic tool. Uh, during that time, our internal team, which was comprised of some of our district-wide experts, those being members of the Office of Teaching and Learning, uh, Dr. Heather Ronan, Dr. Julian Andrade, and three uh, veteran teachers from the Huntington who have since moved on into new positions at schools across the district, uh, where they were pioneers of our work in ELT and more specifically the work in our STEM focus group. Uh, we felt that they provided a very unique lens to the work at the Huntington, comparing us to our district level peers, but then looking at the conditions of effectiveness that they were very familiar with, being very invested and involved in the Huntington Expanded Learning Time Initiative since 2009. 
uh, during the time that the team of evaluators came in, once in the fall and then again in the spring, using that quality diagnostic tool, uh, they determined that the Huntington Elementary School showed 40% growth across the performance index from the fall to the spring, which I think is very notable. Um, I would attribute most of this impact to the efforts of our educators and building capacity among them in terms of integrating the six strands of STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, which tends to take a back seat, but it is a very much a large part of our work at the Huntington, and mathematics learning across the curriculum uh, through their enhanced time for teacher collaboration and their dynamic lesson planning, which is a big part of the work at the Huntington in terms of our expanded learning time initiatives. Uh, within that quality diagnostic tool, I'm sorry to get so technical, but the domains for success are as follows, learning setting, curriculum and content, student engagement, enhanced pathways for STEM learning, professional capacity and learning, community engagement and partnership, and continuous improvement. Um, and this actually sums it up for you to go in depth um, that three videos were made by um, a, a company that was organized through the Overdeck Family Foundation. And um, if Bev LeBlanc, our current IRS, were here, uh, she would tell you that um, they certainly wanted to do things their own way, but we needed to take a little control. Um, however, the three videos are one, fostering excellence in STEM instruction, two, STEM builds 21st century skills, and three, STEM focused schools. So um, all of the videos really discuss why prioritizing STEM for all students is important from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade in order to provide our students with um, the, and equip them with the tools and resources and knowledge that they need in order to compete um, with their suburban peers as well as you know, their peers in other countries. So with that said, I believe um, this video, what we've done is it's an eight and a half minute video. This one represents the STEM focused schools video. Um, we have, thanks to Nicholas Robin, one of our school adjustment counselors at the Huntington, he spent very little time, but this tells you how we are very STEM focused, um, taking this video, which probably shouldn't have been edited. However, he managed to cut the video and narrow it down to only highlight the Huntington components of it, which we've narrowed it from eight minutes to four minutes. I'm sure you're all very excited about that, right? And we've spared you from having to see the other two, but trust me, we have copies. Um, so with that said, uh, the last thing I will mention is that hair and makeup were cut from the budget, so um, don't judge. Oh, so sorry. So much for so much for the technology piece. Can you turn the volume up? So we're going to start with elastic energy, and we're going to convert it into something. Is that part of the box? Up? How are you going to get it out? Oh, In order to have this stem focus, it really took a vision. That vision didn't happen this year. We've had it for many years, and each year we layered it on. And it wasn't something that the principal at the time had decided on their own. It came from really building our school to become a professional learning community. Free Wednesday afternoon, our teachers meet for 90 minutes. That time is parsed out in different ways. It, sometimes they're working in grade levels. Sometimes they're working with a partner teacher, for instance, the art teacher will come in and work with a grade level to really develop some of the priorities so that through art class, they are also working on some of their science, technology, engineering, or mathematics standards. We needed to figure out where we were going to start to layer in the concepts of science at the kindergarten level all the way to fifth grade so that we could start to vertically align curriculum so that everyone was working towards the same goals when we were selecting curriculum to use, when we were pacing ourselves, first in English language arts and in then science, we were finding a way for it to become an integrated curriculum. We developed a year at a glance 
as a team where we can follow the same exact scope and sequence by strand so that we all have a school-wide focus on each strand of the STEM education. The Huntington School created a website to help with our science curriculum, so it was a really great idea to be able to have all of our science materials in one general spot to allow us all to be able to go on and say, this is what they're teaching in first grade. And the website also allowed us to generalize all of our curriculum so that we can have a school-wide focus, so we can all focus on one specific science strand at a time to really pool our resources together. Your hypothesis was, I'm gonna pull the air out and it's gonna crush. What did you observe happening? What better support can you have than a neighboring teacher college? That's Bridgewater State University. They come in and work in our third grade classroom as our showcase scientist of the month. We tell them some of the standards, they determine what their niche is, and they come up with some wonderful activities to present to our students. Science from Scientists comes in twice a month, and we work in grades four and five, and planning teams in grades four and five determine what modules we want that coincide with the standards we're teaching at that moment in time. They provide students with a mini lesson and then engage them in some hands-on activities. No research shows that students do better when their families are part of their learning process. We bring families into the building, walk through it at a time where learning is at its best. And by best, I mean the students have either created something, they have worked as a whole class or in small group, and they have something to share or show. Sometimes it's presenting to families that come to their run, and sometimes it's a family pulling a chair up, getting their hands dirty, and experimenting with student or doing some sort of a make and take so that learning will continue when the kids go home. I, I know that I did most of the talking, but really uh, the work is coming from the focus group around STEM education where they have internalized all of the ELT conditions of effectiveness as well as the quality diagnostic tool. And there's a member of every grade level on that team that really drives the work and they meet monthly and then they take that work back to their weekly meetings or their common planning meetings that also meet weekly. And they really drive the curriculum and lesson planning in order to make sure that from K to five, science is really part of their regular school day. So uh, Allison Colarusso is our STEM focus group facilitator. Uh, Kathy Convey is a kindergarten teacher. And really, when I think about kindergarten and the science language that has been infused in that classroom, there are a couple of photos that really capture the way that the students are beginning to talk about science concepts, even at the kindergarten level. And it's such a language-rich classroom. It, you know, provide, it gives you goosebumps when you think of it. Um, and then Dana, when I think about fifth grade and really thinking about kindergarten all the way to fifth grade and the way that there is such connected learning and all of the resources are pooled together and without that time for you know our educators to really communicate about their priorities and what the needs are at fifth grade so that gaps can be filled in from fourth, third, second, first, and kindergarten, there's really been such growth over time and I think that you know, in thinking about, um, at the time, Principal Saba uh, being part of the Huntington redesign and really driving that work, I think going from 2009 to the present, there has been such a great deal of work and it's really been built and the foundation has been developed. And I just want to thank you all for providing that support many years ago to allow us these initiatives moving forward because our students have clearly benefited from that. So thank you. I think it's important as we talk about redesigning our schools and looking at project-based learning, uh, looking at opportunities for our kids. We are very fortunate to have an extended learning time school that has opportunities for grants and opportunities to share some of the things they've learned in their professional learning communities with schools throughout our district. So again, it's, uh, I want to thank them for 
uh, being at the forefront of a lot of piloting that have been very successful. So I always say this, we certainly know how to do it. We just need the tools. We need the additional time. Uh, we need the uh, additional resources and we'll continue even during these very difficult times to go out and look for grants, look for opportunities for our schools uh, and we're very pleased to be able to you know, have our school uh, highlighted and focused with other schools that are showing uh, real um, progress with initiatives with STEM or STEAM. Mr. D'Agostino. Make a few comments, uh, the Huntington School being in Ward 3. Um, you know, I've, uh, I, I love what the superintendent said about how we, we know how to do it. We just need the tools, and the Huntington School is a great example of how we know. We know what, how to do it here in Brockton. Um, you know, I've, I'm always impressed with um, the commitment of the team at the Huntington, um, and I've, I've spent some time there with both Principal Saba and Principal O'Brien. Um, and, and they've been kind enough to bring me into classrooms and really let me see what you know, is, is going on every day in the school and, and the, the level of commitment of, of the students and all of the staff and teachers is what makes all that happen. It's, it's an impressive place and I'm very proud to represent that school. The creativity is what basically jumps out at me. Um, and the interactive learning, the students you can tell are so enthralled and engaged in the, um, you know, the lesson at hand, the interaction, the interactive uh, guests, you know, the uh, teachers from, or uh, students from Bridgewater State. Um, are those, are they, those all teachers or students or professors? Okay. I mean, just uh, it doesn't get better than that in terms of collaboration and creativity. Um, so, you know, my hat's off to you guys over at the Huntington. It's obviously um, the school culture, you, you know, is successful. And um, the out-of-the-box learning, um, I think, is so beneficial for students. And I was very impressed, obviously, with uh, the parents also. Um, being part of the uh, equation and um, you know you, you if your parent is in the classroom you would know that you're mindful that you better behave <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's just a great um, combination and a win-win all around so um, excellent job okay all right thank you very much um, I also want to uh, call attention, and when we have time during the summer, I'd like to focus on it uh, a little more, but today we had the opportunity to uh, close out our administrative internship program with our uh, administrative uh, interns. And it was a, a wonderful afternoon where we had them do something that we really hadn't done before. We invited a number of our uh, district administrators, many that had worked with our interns, and we had them present to us their projects in supporting the district. And what I will tell you, not only did they come together and do an excellent job supporting each other, developing their own professional learning community with each other, with support, but also shared with us all the opportunities that they had throughout the district of being in schools, taking on administrative roles, and performing uh, many things that, that, again, when the year gets very busy, that we just don't have the time to do, such as um, you saw online streaming during your high school graduation. That happened, again, with an intern. When you talk about uh, looking at uh, 504 plans in the district, which are large, and we're looking at protocols, that happened because of an intern. You know, we looked at um, supporting uh, our children choosing middle schools and how nervous they are going from an elementary to a middle school or a middle to a high school. One of the projects was an orientation. So there are numbers and numbers of, of projects that I will be sharing with you um, during the summer. I think our meeting is July 11th. So I hope to have uh, the PowerPoint that was done today, the packet, so you can actually see the work that was done in the district. So our administrative interns, I think you are out there still. I know you've had a very long day. Would you please stand up and take a bow? And I want to thank you for all the hard work you know, during this internship.
the one thing that I said to them, uh, and I asked every one of them after going through the internship, you know, do you have uh, a, a dream job? Is there something somewhere that you see yourself? And time after time again, what I feel good about and always have in the Brockton Public Schools is we grow our own administrators. That is your strength. And every one of them, you know, talked about you know jobs that they could see themselves in, but talked about whatever opportunity comes along. And the best thing that I think they would join me in saying that we learned today was when you take an elementary teacher and all of a sudden they're in high school, working in high school programs, or again a high school teacher coming down to our elementary school. The best line of the day was Billy Sproles, who talked about coming from our alternative program, found himself at one of our elementary schools and talked about how he didn't realize how important it was to tie shoes and all of the different things that maybe our elementary teachers take for granted. So this was uh, truly uh, an exceptional group. Um, we're excited about the future for Brockton, and I think that's something that we really needed at this point in time. So thank you very much, and I look forward to highlighting all of your projects. Um, also, uh, I'd like to invite Deputy Superintendent Thomas to come up. We have been working on what we call the District Capacity Project. And if you recall, our previous District Capacity Project I've talked about was our UNIDOS program, which uh, took about three or four years that we implemented at the Raymond School this past year with our kindergartners. We'll grow into grade one this year. Um, and we have another project, and this is a project of the school committee with school committee representation, with management with the superintendent, and also with our Brockton Education Association partner, with a facilitator, uh, Ray Shirtliff, who was our facilitator in the first project. So our project is a code of conduct. We have uh, teachers on board. We have a, a group that has been uh, meeting on a very, very regular basis. And when you talk about a code of conduct, this is something eventually we're starting out looking at a high school, but we're talking about every one of the levels. So when parents come on board with little kindergartners, they know what the expectations are. They know what the partnering is. You talk about expectations in the classroom, behavior, all of that to certainly get our students to the point that they are productive, able to graduate from high school, and able to um, certainly uh, excel in their academics. So I need my coach here, Kim Gibson, to okay, come up Kim, with me. Okay, Kim, please come up. <laughs> I'm letting you off the hook. Oh, I'm inviting you up. Thank you. I, I want to thank the committee members. Uh, it's Carlton Campbell, Sean Desmond, Emily Flores, Kim Gibson, Brett Gormley, Robert Howard, Julie Morgan, Cliff Murray, Lisa Plant, June Saber McGuire, Dee Smith, uh, Superintendent Smith, myself, and uh, Sharon Walder. Uh, so I want to thank the group has been working over the last four months to identify first um, working on the handbook at the high school for the new code of conduct that um, we want to stretch throughout the system and make it age appropriate for elementary school, middle school, uh, in the high school so the expectations stay the same at every level. So if a student for some reason moves from South Middle School to East Middle School or West Middle School, you know, it's, there's consistency, even though there is in our handbooks, they're universal for all middle schools, but how they're interpreted in different buildings, uh, it needs to be a little bit more uniform. So this is part of this uh, project. Um, right now, we wanted to focus on some, some things that um, are important to the community. Um, and a couple of those that we're really focusing on is the use of cell phones in schools. Uh, as you know, it's a, um, for any assistant principal, or assistant dean, or principal, uh, it's a battle with cell phones, um, with the teachers, with the students, um, and we understand parents um, that want their students to have cell phones because of safety and security, and everybody knows what happens nowadays with safety and security and how much you've put into safety and security into the schools, uh, and parents need to feel safe uh, with their kids being able to have a cell phone to and from school and in school, but again, it cannot disrupt the, um, the educational process and the learning process. So we're focusing on that. We're also focusing on bullying and cyberbullying. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on that, uh, talking about it, as you know, um, and we discussed this before. Um, unfortunately, you know, the old days are gone where if there, there was bullying in the past, it was always face to face, which obviously is never okay. Uh, but now bullying can happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week through Facebook, text messaging, and other social media, media outlets that 
yeah, I don't, I'm not too familiar with because I don't spend much time on those things. But um, it's an issue. It's an issue that we need to deal with as a school system, but most importantly with our community. Um, and the part of this is really, as we move forward, is to get the parents involved. So I want to let Kim jump in and, and um, the work that she, uh, she's doing with the teachers and the members of um, the BEA and the, the members of the teachers that are on this committee. So I want to thank the members, um, as Mike mentioned, the BEA. I don't think that's on. Oh, you don't think mine. so? <laughs> well, I knocked over earlier. <laughs> they didn't want me on tonight. That's okay. <laughs> You missed the earlier show. <laughs> I knocked it over. <laughs> so I do want to thank the members of the committee. Emily is actually here um, from the high school. And I will say the high school is, has been our focus. We also have um, worked with some of the other buildings as well to do a survey over the climate and, and everything within their buildings. The teachers have been thrilled to be part of it. They've been able to give their, um, have their voice heard. We will be looking over those results over the summertime, giving you an update. Um, the superintendent and I will be meeting with the staff at some point. We just have, a, have to work that out and just letting them know that we will actually involve them in the process moving forward further um, in the fall. We only have a limited number on the committee right now, but the intention is to expand that to all the different levels to include elementary and middle school um, more so than they currently are. But I have to say it's been a great um, project because we can see that we will move the district forward and have that consistency from building to building. Um, I think the parents will appreciate it, the teachers will, will appreciate it, and administrators as well. As Mike said, when you have these students who go from building to building, it just gives that consistency. Even though there's a handbook, it's a common language that everyone knows. So that, that's pretty much what I have to say tonight. All right, we can take any questions. Uh, my vision is that in every family, you have, a, a, when I say an attractive handbook, you know, something that is easily accessible to look up uh, different consequences or expectations for behaviors, something that could be actually put on the refrigerator. So it, it's conversation in the home, people understand the rules, also teachers in the classrooms. We have seen a number of these uh, in a, a couple of large districts, and that is our goal, to have that consistency and that hands-on uh, connection uh, with our homes, with our teachers, so that the behavior is something that we have expectations throughout the whole district with continuity. What are some of the changes that you would feel are uh, going to be impactful? I think um, we really need to spend a lot of time with the cell phones. Um, I think we've done a nice job. Um, I think the dress code is, is with the changes that we made as a group. Over the, um, the last few meetings we had, I think that's a solid start, which I think we could actually leave in place. Um, but I think the cell phones um, coming up with a um, just an agreement with um, between the schools, the community, the parents, the kids, um, you know, it's something that we really need to come up with a better idea of when cell phones can be used in the building and uh, when it can't disrupt um, the educational process. So that's a big one. Um, and also the bullying. I think we need to spend some time uh, helping parents uh, understand uh, how severe it is with the social media and the text message. And I think um, we need their help identifying uh, issues that are going on before they come into the school. Uh, I actually had put that one number one, um, but it goes hand in hand with cell phones because again, if students are able to use cell phones in the school, it's things are set up and you know not good things happen. When, text messages and is going on and you know things are planned that uh, really um, you know good behavior and that's that's something we really I think those two things have to really be a focus on the, us as a committee um, the administration but also mostly with parents and kids thank you mr. Sullivan the new changes you have in the handbooks when is that going to go into effect this September the dress code changes we made in the handbook, that will be in effect this September for the 2017-2018 um, handbooks. So the recommendations that uh, this committee made in the sub policy subcommittee, those have all been in implemented and I believe it's being voted on tonight to finalize the handbooks. Um, Wanda, am I right on that one? Did we already do that? It's already okay. done, it's already done. That last? Okay, so that's done. Um, and then the rest of this will move forward throughout Next year, we, we, we're planning on having some community meetings to get parents' input 
uh, especially on these main issues of cell phones and bullying. Uh, we want the parents' input. We're going to try to hit every corner of the city and have meetings at the old four uh, junior highs, the middle schools, west, east, north, and south, to try to get um, parents involved uh, to talk about these two major issues and hopefully have a, a handbook and a code of conduct that looks a lot different next year at each level. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and let me finish up with a couple of uh, announcements. Um, I did receive uh, a couple of phone calls from school committee members concerned about our end of the year uh, calendar. Um, so one of the things I will say that this year was a little bit different. We ended up taking two additional half days because of the uh, packing up of a number of the school moves that we have going on. That would have happened today, uh, being Tuesday the 20th, tomorrow being Wednesday the 21st. Our last day of school will be on the 22nd of June, which is always a half day, not only for students, but for teachers also. The concern uh, came about our Gilmore Preschool Center. A number of you had received phone calls about the school year uh, ending earlier. Um, that is not the case. Um, the principal sent out a message probably two or three weeks ago informing parents of the very messages that we certainly have been sending out. I sent out a reminder this past Sunday, but the one thing that I will commit to you in having conversation and looking at the Gilmore transitioning to the Barrett Russell Preschool, I will work with Principal Joanne Camillo to make sure from the very beginning of the year that um, we do have end of the year celebrations, all of the things that many of us have been attending uh, this past week or last week, uh, but the last day of school is the last day of school for every student in the Brockton Public Schools. So we will work with our schools to make sure calendars go out with our very newest parents that come on board, our preschool parents or um, you know, our, our students and making sure that they have a calendar in hand that talks about you know, what the end of the year celebrations are, what those dates are in September so that they can make clear plans. Unfortunately, what does happen is we end up with snow days or days where we have to readjust the calendar. But we will readjust the calendar to reflect whatever those additional days are. And uh, the last thing that I want to talk about this evening, other than uh, some of, well, let me, uh, and I know a number of you will join me. There are so many wonderful things that have been going on, and I'll let you take the floor with so many of them. We went to a gala the other evening. Uh, Mayor, you and I have been following each other, I think, all over. We were at the Empower Yourself Gala. Uh, the Brockton Housing Authority uh, had us speak about the Brockton Public Schools, the Adult Learning Center has had a number, uh, tonight is actually, I think, their final recognition. There were recognition ceremonies going uh, on throughout the district. There are field trips, uh, there are celebrations, uh, just wonderful, wonderful things. And I wanna thank everybody from the families to our teachers, uh, to our administrators, to all of our school committee members that I know are just stretched very thin as far as all the things that you're trying to attend. I had the pleasure of going to South Middle School on Friday evening in the pouring rain for a wonderful uh, dance end of the year celebration. Uh, Chatwells came with their ice cream card, uh, you know, dancing going on, kids looking wonderful. And I know that went on at so many of the middle schools out there. So, you know, again, thank you for all the wonderful things that you do provide uh, for our students. Uh, and I do want to um, make an announcement, uh, you know, before I leave this evening. Um, we, when we talk about cuts throughout the district, there have been cuts at the executive team level as well as well as administrative teams. And one of the most important things that we do is to be able to support what is happening in our 18,000 student district. So uh, there will be some changes going forward uh, in school year 17-18. I'm asking people to take on additional duties, duties that increase uh, some of the duties they had previously. One of the biggest changes is I have asked high school principal Sharon Wolder, uh, again, there will be a press release going out, to take on a position uh, as Chief Officer of Student Support Services. She will be responsible for special education, equity, civil rights, guidance, nursing, data services. She will also take on an additional role of diversity training for students and staff, as well as cultural proficiency for the district. I am very pleased under Sharon's leadership, you have a level one high school. It's been focused on literacy. Uh, we uh, again transitioned out of a zero tolerance era to implement chapter 222, which has not been easy. Enacted a new schedule at the high school, implemented new security measures, secured new accreditation at Brockton High School, achieved consistent national recognition 
raised graduation rates, lowered dropout rates, and moved ahead with success after success despite challenges in a school uh, of over 4,300 students. So I'm excited to have Sharon uh, come down and join uh, our uh, executive team on a regular basis. That being said, one of the most important decisions we make when you talk about a high school uh, is your support for a principal leading the flagship of the Brockton Public Schools. Although those are big shoes to fill, I have asked somebody to fill those shoes. I've asked Dr. Clifford Murray, who is presently principal at West Middle School, to take on the role as principal of Brockton High School. And he will do that uh, very soon. There will be quite a bit of transitioning with the two this summer. Um, again, there are you know the, the budget challenges that we've talked about. I'm going to ask him again to, to lead a team into a new era and continue to, to take on uh, some of those duties. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas will not be Deputy Superintendent of Operations. He is the Deputy Superintendent taking on many additional duties. One of them will be to support uh, Dr. Murray at the high school, a place where Mr. Thomas uh, worked a lot of years. We'll be supporting curriculum, instruction, discipline, code of conduct, culture, climate, all of those things that, uh, again, we are so proud of our high school and we'll continue to do that. I've also asked uh, June Saber McGuire to take on an additional role. Previously, uh, she was teaching and learning pre-K to five. Uh, I'm asking and was juggling a principal uh, support this year at the Gilmore Early Childhood Center. Her title will just be Chief Academic Officer. So we will work to support all of the academics uh, throughout our district. Uh, Dr. Tarasi, again, our Executive Director of Pupil Personnel, will move into a part-time role working on policy, social and emotional learning, additional district initiatives. He will work closely with me in supporting mandates implemented at both the state and federal levels. Um, again, when we talk about all of the things that come down from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on a, on a regular basis, you know, district reviews, coordinated program reviews, you know, civil rights actions. So these are the kind of things that I'm very pleased that Dr. Tarasi will continue to support me on. Um, and again, your other executive uh, directors will remain in their roles, but will continue to take on additional duties for those losses that, that we have suffered administratively in the district. And I will be getting a press release uh, out to everybody. And that, I believe, other than one more, if I can have a moment of levity. And Deputy Superintendent Thomas, this is for you to listen to. So earlier today, I will tell you, and I told you how excited I was about working with our interns and having them present. And, and Deputy Superintendent Thomas always brings levity to many of the things, thank goodness. And one of our interns got up and, and she was very excited to share her presentation. And she made the comment that she likes to talk a lot. So if she talked a little bit more than usual, we had to understand that her husband and her mother always complain about her talking on and on endlessly. So from the back of the room, as we're all focused on our interns, Deputy Superintendent yells out from the back, oh, don't worry about that. We're used to somebody talking on and on and on. So, um, so again, I want to thank you, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, and here's how I'm getting back at you. So Deputy Superintendent and I have always talked about therapy dogs. I've had Laurie Mason contact me. Is Laurie still here? So Laurie's left. Contacted me about special needs students or any student when you bring in what's called a therapy dog. And a therapy dog comes in, and they'll actually have kids read to the dog. They loved being able to do that. There's no challenge. There's no threat felt. Um, and, and in many different school systems, they have therapy dogs. And every time I bring it up, Deputy, Deputy Superintendent Thomas says to me, we have to be concerned. Imagine a dog in a classroom. What if something happens? So, uh, you know. I would like to bring the therapy dog in, but I've backed off. I've listened to Deputy Superintendent Thomas. So the best thing happened today. At the end of the day, Principal Brian Rogan from the Kennedy School was very excited and showed up at my office door. He had been at Central, and he came in, and he said to me, I have to tell you about the best news today. He said, we had the Kennedy Booster-thon, I believe it was. Fun. And you know, the, what's it called? I'm sorry? Fun. Booster-thon. Fun run. Fun run. And, and he said, and what I told the kids is if we did well in this fun run, that I would do something really special. And of course, knowing Mr. Rogan, he has to tie it into the curriculum. So you've seen principals with silly string and principals getting taped to walls. But Principal Rogan told me today 
that his promise was, and this was something with a Shakespearean literacy used being told by a pig. So what, I know this sounds crazy, but what he did was he told the kids if they read the books and if they took part in this, that he would kiss a pig. So today at the Kennedy School, lo and behold, a little pot belly pig showed up. I wish I could have prepared to show this on the big screen. So Mr. Rogan went around and every student, I think they had three or four different settings where the kids were so excited, got to see the pig come to school. Mr. Rogan embraced him, kissed the pig, and Deputy Superintendent Thomas, I'm told that this pig is being trained as a therapy pig. So I am really excited to bring this therapy pig to the Brockton Public Schools. So, <laughs> that's another story. But again, so that's it, Mayor. That's it? That's sure it. Now. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. How about uh, items to refer to subcommittee? Does anyone have anything they'd like referred to a subcommittee? Hearing nothing there, Mr. Minicello, do you want to do a report on tonight's finance subcommittee? Sure, certainly. Uh, the finance subcommittee uh, met at approximately 6.20. Uh, this evening, um, we basically discussed, uh, you know, the state of the school budget. Um, Superintendent Smith, uh, Mayor Carpenter, and myself uh, addressed uh, some of the concerns. Um, Mr. Diagostino also um, commented on some of the items. Uh, at that um, subcommittee meeting, it was clear um, that um, there was a with regard to net school spending and non-net school spending, uh, there was a number that the school committee uh, has to work with currently uh, with regard to how those monies are distributed and spent, uh, that, that there is still time uh, for more work with respect to um, the allocation of the funds. Um, the uh, amount adopted at the subcommittee, uh, finance subcommittee for net school spending uh, was the 161,043,295 uh, with, again with regard to net school spending and with regard to non-net school spending. The amount, total amount was $10,172,063. That in essence was the um, items and uh, information presented at the finance subcommittee. Please. Uh, how about a motion uh, to accept the report? Motion has been made, seconded. All in favor? Okay. Do you need a separate piece of action on approving those numbers? And then just basically that um, a motion to ratify uh, the uh, amount adopted with regard to FY18 net school spending, which was a total of 161 40, uh, 161 million 43,295. Um, dollars and with regard to non-net school spending for FY18, the total amount was ten million one seventy-two sixty-three. Okay, so we need a motion to ratify uh, those budget figures as approved earlier this evening in the finance subcommittee. Yeah. Figures presented in the finance subcommittee yeah. meeting. Motion has been made. Second. Properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Five in the affirmative. Okay, so that completes that piece of business. Does anyone else have anything under new business they'd like to get on the table? Mr. D'Agostino. Yeah, I apologize. I know the meeting's gone on quite a bit, but I do have two items under new business. Um, first, um, uh, Ms. Plant asked me if I would read a statement uh, regarding the recent, um, that we've learned that the Arnone School did not get a grant that they applied for. And she asked if I would read her uh, thoughts on that um, So, in her absence. Um, so I regret that I am not in attendance to express um, personally how disappointed I am in the Arno that the Arnone School did not receive the Level 3 turnaround grant. The teachers, Ms. Proudler and Mr. St. Peter, put forth all of their efforts, and our students certainly deserved it. The staff at the Arnone know exactly what their children need. What they don't have are the funds to implement it. 
We must strive for equality in education. It is the equalizer these students need, and we must not fail in providing it. Um, okay, so that's that item. Yep. <clears throat> the second one, um, and I've presented this about a year ago, something similar on a resolve to ask the state to implement the Chapter 70 um, Budget Review Commission uh, recommendations. Um, and this is also something that Mass Association of School Committees is asking committees to do again. Um, everybody should have a copy of it. I, I believe I, I distributed it at the beginning. Um, so I'll, I'll read it in and, and uh, ask that we take a vote on, on this. Um, whereas the Constitution of the Commonwealth, 1780, requires it shall be the duty of, the, of legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this Commonwealth to cherish the, in, cherish the interests of literature and the sciences, public schools and grammar schools in the towns. And whereas McDuffie versus Secretary of the Executive Office of Education, 1993, declared the Massachusetts Constitution imposes an enforceable duty on the magistrates and legislatures of this Commonwealth to provide education to the public schools for the children they are enrolled, whether they be rich or poor, and without regard to the fiscal capacity of the community or district in which such children live, it shall be declared also that the constitutional duty is not being currently fulfilled by the Commonwealth. And whereas Hancock versus the Commissioner of Education 2005 concluded, I do not suggest that the goals of education reform adopted since McDuffie have been fully achieved. Clearly they have not. not nothing I say today would, in, would insulate the Commonwealth from a successful challenge under the education clause in different circumstances. And whereas the, Mass the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center reporting cutting class 2011 found the real value of the original foundation budget has eroded significantly over time, due in part to rapid cost growth for health care and special education. Since the foundation budget's original design did not foresee the, this rapid cost growth, Spending reductions have been forced in other key areas, especially regular education teachers. And whereas the Foundation Budget Review Commission of 2015 resolved the good work begun by the Education Reform Act of 1993 and the educational progress made since will be at risk so long as our school systems are fiscally strained by the ongoing failure to substant substantively reconsider the adequacy of the foundation budget. Therefore, we, the Brockton School Committee, petition the 190th General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to implement without further delay in full, in full the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Okay, so are we taking that in the form of a motion then to uh, adopt this yeah, resolve adopt. on behalf of the full school committee? Okay, any discussion prior to a vote? all it basically um, outlines over the years the history uh, and obligation to fund public education uh, adequately for um, all students of the Commonwealth and I think that um, it's very applicable to our situation and I wholeheartedly would support you know the adoption of that result okay there's no further discussion uh, motion has been made do we have a second second all in favor up to unanimously. Anything else under new business? Um, it's only nine o'clock. Yeah, really. <laughs> Very um, as the superintendent pointed out, uh, the empower yourself function was excellent. They were wonderful speakers, and um, it really highlights the, the program and also the um, the impact that it's that program has on students. The students were extremely, again, well spoken. And you can just see how um, they uh, have a wonderful, bright future in, in finance and business. Um, this morning, uh, I had um, the privilege, really, to attend uh, an adult learning center graduation. They have several. They have, I think, four. I was able to go to today, this morning's. Um, I know, Mr. Mayor, you were at the um, Adult Learning Center, I believe, yesterday. I was there yesterday. And I was told that the people were basically very, um, 
very honored and tickled that you were there. They really were, were moved. Um, Mr. Sullivan uh, was there, and certainly the superintendent of schools was there. I, all, I could, all I said to the superintendent after the, um, the function was how lovely these people are that graduated today. They are so sweet and they just embrace everything that is good about this country and wanting to um, better themselves and wanting to learn English and students, you know, there for different programs, you know, getting their what used to be a GED, but Madam Superintendent, it's the HISET. Um, and um, I mean, just so many success stories and um, I was just moved. I, I was so impressed. Um, <laughs> Once in a while at graduation at the high school, you'll get a student that will come up when you shake their hand and they give you a big hug. Well, I couldn't tell you how many people just came up and were hugging us. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Um, it, was, it, it really is something to be seen. And, um, the, you know, these are adults who, you know, are just following their passion. Some of them basically, um, doing a redo, you know, in terms of what they didn't accomplish or, or were able to do when they were younger and said to themselves, you know what, I have unfinished business and I'm going to succeed. And, you know, one person, one, one woman was basically saying, I want to be an example for my children. She was so well spoken. Um, I mean, just so impressive wanting to set the example for her kids is planning on, you know, going to Massasoit and continuing her education uh, and getting a college degree. Um, it was something to behold. I, I was so happy that I went, you know. Um, it was great. It was just great. Um, um, that's Mr. Mancello, for every graduate that you saw today, one of the comments that I had made, not to rain on the parade, because it was a wonderful day, and wonderful people, as you said, citizenship and diplomas, and many past MCAS going on to Massasoit, Bridgewater English State. proficiency, you know. You know jobs. It, it, it was awesome. Business partners there, yeah. but the thing, that I want to say to everybody is we have a, a waiting list that is huge and continues to grow again as those grants continue to be cut at, at a state and federal level. So these are things that when we talk about successes, these are people again that'll be productive, that are learning the language, that are acclimating you know, to, uh, to the culture, uh, are getting jobs, are supporting. So we need to continue to find ways when we talk about education it's not enough that we have everything on our plate that we have, but you know our adult population is ready and willing. They're on waiting lists, and they want to be part of the American dream. They want to give back. They want to support their own children that are in the Brockton Public Schools, and we need to continue to advocate for those dollars as well. It was just an impressive glow. That room glowed, and uh, I can't say enough. It, it was a great. great morning. It's a great experience. I was there yesterday morning. I mean, there's four of them. I wish I could make them all, but I try to make at least one every year. And uh, it is inspirational. It absolutely is. Um, and Tom, I've always felt you were the most huggable member of the school. Yeah. So I'm yeah. glad that they all feel the there's same way. There's a lot way. to hug. Yeah. 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 Tim was hugging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Anything else, Senator? Oh, second year, one, uh, one more, one more thing. Um, yeah, yeah, but. Um, we need to, um, you know, speak to our delegation and find out, you know, strategize in terms of what a good date is to basically, um, you know, move, have our movement of the, you know, Brockton Kids Count campaign on the, st on the steps of Beacon Hill. Do you want me to follow Hill. up with that or? Yeah, if, if, take if you that could, you know, time. I would say call Representative Cronin and Senator Brady and, you know. We'll call uh, both offices tomorrow. Uh, Sure yeah, it, it, can represent the great, and then we can get the word out and um, you know take the next step. You know, very good. I think we'll look to get some buses. I know we had talked about the possibility of looking uh, with some of our bus partners. Wonderful. Uh, to see if we can find a way to um, get people up to the state house uh, in a safe manner. Yeah. So we'll start to get the word out. We'll come up with a date, and we'll come up with our plan as part of our advocacy. Great. With the money we saved on air conditioning tonight, we can probably pay for the buses. That's it, yeah. <laughs> I took my jacket off two hours ago. 
Um, anyone else in a new business? Are we all good? Real quick. Another one? I apologize. Okay. Going on with uh, the superintendent men mentioned the um, boost of thought at the Kennedy School. Um, in addition to getting Principal Rogan to kiss a pig, they also accomplished, and this was the, the PAC and the teachers and staff that supported this, and of course the kids running their little legs off, as well as private sponsors as well. Um, they were able to raise $20,000 wow. through that event. That's great. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Very good. That's up to them. Great job. Okay, on that positive note, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Please, someone? Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Sullivan? Properly second. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Thank you.